Uh, we'll call to order the select board meeting for February 22nd, 2021. Um, it's seven o'clock. Um, first motion is to approve the agenda. I move to approve the agenda as listed. Unless there's changes or additions. Is there a second? Second. All right, it's been moved and seconded. Uh, any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Uh, consent agenda items, minutes from February 1st meeting and the liquor licenses for Village Market, Best Western Plus, Blush Hill Country Club, Shaw's Country Club of Vermont, Old Stagecoach Inn, Butcher's, Butler Street Pizza, Fast Stop, and Champlain Farms. Can I get a motion? I move to approve the consent agenda. Is there a second? Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Uh, public, anyone from the public wish to speak this evening before we get into the rest of the agenda? Okay. Um, we'll move on to select board items. A, consider Waterbury Reader as an alternate newspaper of record. Would like to speak to that. <coughs> Mark, I can, do you want me to speak to that, Bill? Sure. Okay, so uh, the Times Argus is still our primary um, paper of record. But uh, the Waterbury Reader, as all of you know, goes out to all the um, mailboxes in <coughs> Waterbury and it's widely available. Uh, we have been advertising our DRV meetings, for instance, our, our public hearings in both, but that's very expensive. The Reader costs as much or more than um, the Times Argus to advertise. So what we'd like you to do, or what we're requesting is that you um, consider the Waterway Reader is an alternate newspaper of record that we could use exclusively when we uh, we do notices, and that will keep us within budget, and it will actually get the notices to um, more people in the Waterbury area for for local projects of local interest. Okay. Um, anyone have any concerns with that? I think it's a good idea. I think it's reaching more people than ever in town. Makes perfect sense as less and less people are you are buying, you know, papers, you know, ones that come to every mailbox in Waterbury makes sense. All right. Um, I'll take a motion. I make a motion to approve the Waterbury Reader as an alternate uh, paper of record. Is there a second? Second it. Right. Moved and seconded. Any further discussion? I'm just going to abstain from it because I do write for them. Okay, no problem. Um, all right. Uh, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Who seconded, please? Matt, I believe. Matt, yeah, okay, thank you. Matt. Um, next up, discuss informational meetings scheduled for tomorrow, Tuesday, February 23rd at 7 p.m. Right, so uh, the public hearing scheduled for the interim bylaws tonight starts at 7.15, so we have this kind of as a filler right now. Um, I think you're all, all should be set for tomorrow night's meeting, which is the public information meeting that we need to have uh, because we're having town meeting by Australian ballot on um, Tuesday, I mean, yeah, Tuesday, the 2nd of March. So um, you've all received the agenda, I believe. The select board members have received the agenda. And I think it's pretty straightforward. Um, Carla and Liz Schlegel will kind of uh, make some introductory remarks to let the folks that are attending the meeting uh, understand how it will be conducted, um, that there is a, a way to... Uh, uh, write, write questions. We're, we're going to try to, as much as possible, encourage people to um, put their questions in writing that they can be um, 
funneled through Liz and then to the to me or the board. Um, there will be an opportunity for people to raise their hand. However, if there needs to be some discussion, um, you know, it's hard to do that in, in writing. So if, uh, you know, people want to ask a question about an answer, uh, they can certainly do that verbally. Uh, Mark is going to more or less be the moderator of the meeting. Um, it's, this is a select board public hearing. It's not town meeting. So the uh, town moderator will not be attending the meeting or at least not be attending as moderator. So Mark will lead us through the rest of the agenda. And uh, when it gets to the agenda item where uh, we begin to talk about the budget, uh, I think the easiest thing to do will be to maybe let me provide an overview of the budgets, the implications for taxes and the like. And then after I finish an overview, uh, select board members can add anything that they feel is important to, uh, to communicate with the, with the public. And then obviously we'll encourage the public if they have them to um, ask questions. So, um, and then at the very end, Carla will um, explain again what town meeting will be like, uh, both uh, voting by absentee ballot and how the in-person voting at the school on Tuesday the 2nd will take place. So I think that's really it. Uh, if the board members have questions right now about the process, I'll try to answer them. Um, we can come back to this issue after the public hearing closes if the, if the board has um, more lengthy questions. So I was gonna <laughs> suggest to you that you're gonna have to put your talking hat on for tomorrow night because I suspect suspected that you'd be doing most of the uh, talking. Is there gonna be uh, any, <coughs> any screen information uh, as far as the budget numbers are concerned to help with this process uh, or are you just gonna wing it by voice? And uh, uh, I mean, I, I know you're completely familiar with every bit of the information uh, because yeah. you wrote every bit of it. So there shouldn't yeah. be any questions that I meant for. Yeah, so, no, there is, there will be the ability to screen share, Chris. And uh, my, my, um, thought right now is that when we talk about the budget, there's the page in the annual report that uh, is the kind of summary of the operating funds. Uh, looks like that. Um, I'll put that up. That has, you know, the kind of general uh, department by department um, uh, totals for the general fund. It has the highway operating fund and the library fund. And then I'll also, uh, when it comes time to uh, talk about the uh, capital budget, I'll put the summary up. And then if people want to delve in deeper, you know, the whole, uh, I have all my budget numbers available and I can put anything up that anybody wants to see. So yeah, I will try to do it with a little bit of show and tell as well as just, you know, I think it's easier than me just talking people can actually see some numbers. So will Mark just be reading uh, each article as the, on the warning as it comes down through? Or, I mean, there's no sense in dividing it up amongst board members, is there? We're right. not, we're right. not voting it's, on it off the floor. That's right. It's not gonna, we're not gonna be making motions. So I think Mark will just follow the agenda um, for the meeting tomorrow night. And if we need to, we can fill in to people and say, okay, this is article eight or this is article nine. But uh, I think Mark can just uh, go through that agenda, uh, turn it over to me when appropriate. And then if other board members want to speak, obviously you should be able to speak as well. All right, Mark, I think it's uh, 715 now. So we should recess this part of it and you should uh, go ahead and open the public hearing. Uh, for the interim bylaws, and then we can come back to the rest of the agenda after the hearing is done. 
I have seven ten. Is it all right to start five minutes early, or do we need to wait? I was going to say that's what I got too. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's what my clock says at home. No, we shouldn't start five minutes early. We should wait until my computer number is off here, unfortunately. But so we don't have to get all all dressed up for tomorrow night either, do we? <laughs> no, you don't, Chris. <laughs> You don't want them to waste up, Chris. You, you, can come in, you, you can come in your pajamas if you want. Yeah. yeah We're yeah. expecting you to wear a shirt and tie tomorrow. <laughs> At least you afford, afford you that. Oh, uh, yeah. Um, off, off the subject there, kind of, I heard uh, Randy Guyatt is quarantined at home. Is that? Um, well, I'm not sure we're supposed to talk about people's health information. Sorry about that. I just, yeah. I do have a question uh, about town meeting since we were going there. Other than like the regular informational meeting, you know, how we usually discuss in kind of other business, you know, people bring up things. You know, we can have usually like the Keith Wallace Award and stuff like that. Will will that be anything like that be discussed? Um, certainly, if the public has questions, they can ask questions. I have not been made privy to any thing about the Keith Wallace Award, so my expectation is that that isn't going to happen tomorrow. Um, okay. Uh, if somebody knows differently, they, they can let me know. But yeah, the public can ask questions, Mike. Obviously, you know, there's no ability to take any action tomorrow right. at all. It's just information. There's no motions right. or anything like that that can be made. Because, you know, at the end, we typically have some things that usually come up. And, yeah. you know, after we go through the regular information about the budgets and the different uh, warning items, you know, I think it would be good to open it up to people who do have questions or comments. Right. I didn't see that there was anybody up for the Keith Wallace, is there? I'm not, I mean, it's, that's usually something that the EFUD uh, chairperson and the right. town select board chairperson discuss. And uh, I think given the situation and that there's nobody going to be really around to see anybody get a presentation maybe it's been put off for a year like so many other things right well we seem to be gaining ground on that front as well i hope yeah i hope so too vaccination How's that new grandson of yours doing? Well, pretty well. He has a little bit of a rough time sleeping, so that makes it rough for everybody else. But uh, he's healthy and um, seems to be growing well. Uh, I am home now from Georgia. I got home a week ago today. Um, I can talk about my own health situation. So I've been quarantining since I've been home. I did call today uh, Mark Podgeway at Wasi told him when I got home and what I had done. So he told me I could take a test today. I did, and um, three to five days will be when I get the test results. So if it's three days, I'll be in the office Thursday or Friday. If it's five days, I won't be in the office until Monday, but I'm hoping that by the end of the week, I'll be able to circulate anyway. Did you go to the testing facility there in the center? Yeah, right at the Wasi Ambulance Fire and Mark. Yeah, they've been they've been turning them around in a day or two. Oh, good. Let's just hope they get down to the sixty five and over pretty quick and go through some of those bands because we seem to be behind the curve compared to some other states on you know ages. I think they're getting down to 70, Mike, and then they're going to... We're, we're at 70 now. I know, but they're going to... I don't think they're going to go... They're going to go to 65 to 70, but then after that, I think it's going to be 18 to 65-year-olds with underlying conditions, so... Right. 
Okay, I have 7.15. Um, we can start the public hearing portion of the meeting. Okay. Um, the public hearing is to consider and receive public comment on the draft interim bylaws for the downtown zoning district dated February 1st, 2021. Um, a copy was available on our website and we can go ahead and enter that portion of the meeting. So Mark, would you like me to do a, an introduction and yeah. have you walk through the bylaws with you yes. and then we could open it up to the members of the public and others, uh, planning commission members are joining us as well. And um, we've, we've um, noticed their meeting, so they're um, good to go as well. So uh, what I'd like to do is do a screen share, bring up the draft. I also have the map that we discussed a few weeks ago when the select board decided to hold this public hearing. So if you bear with me a minute, I'll go ahead and share my screen. All right, could, uh, let me see if I can uh, resize this a little bit so everybody can see it. I wanna make sure uh, we're okay. Um, does that work for everybody? Can you see the draft? Continue? That's better right there, Steve. Okay, good, good. So what I'd like to do is um, walk through uh, not every section of this. Uh, some of it I think is fairly self-explanatory. Uh, we did a brief walk through when you um, decide to hold this public hearing, but uh, I'd like to talk about these introductory sections and make sure there's a, a common understanding. So uh, this is, um, the authority is with uh, 24 VSA chapter 117, uh, the 44, section 4415 is interim bylaw uh, section. And um, the, the one thing I wanted to mention about this, and I know we've talked <clears throat> a little bit before, but I'd like to go over it, especially for those who are joining the hearing, um, interim bylaws are enabled to address um, special situations, emergency situations, uh, such as the COVID pandemic. Uh, we used an after tropical storm Irene. We had one uh, signed bylaw we enacted with the Main Street Project to help businesses out. So interim bylaws are uh, enacted by the select board like any, uh, any zoning bylaw. Uh, they have a two year lifespan and then the board can opt to adopt them for an additional one year for a total of no more than three years. Uh, during that period, during the two years or uh, the extension, the community uh, can consider permanent bylaws that address the same area or the same issues. The planning commission has uh, spent a lot of time on this, um, this particular uh, area of the downtown zoning district, as well as other areas of the bylaws, um, can do their legislative function, come up with permanent bylaws, hold a hearing, and uh, bring that back to the select board. And once, uh, let's say, permanent bylaws are enacted within the um, two-year period, if they address the same district, the same issues, then um, these bylaws would be superseded by the new permanent bylaws. So I wanted to make sure everybody understands that we're not obligated to live with these for two years. They can be, um, the planning commission can move ahead and, um, and take um, initiative to uh, you know, make some additional changes to that uh, type of thing. So the purpose just um, explains that um, this is for the downtown zoning district. It's, um, related to the pandemic in terms of economic development. We're trying to facilitate projects in the downtown and uh, housing and so on, a diversity of uses, higher than housing. So we're trying to be progressive in this and um, our current zoning regulations, the last comprehensive rewrite was about 25 years ago. So we're, we're definitely due for a major uh, rewrite. So. These bylaws are based on the Unified Development Bylaws that the Planning Commission and I have been working on. And um, so that, that was the basis for, for this. Um, in the applicability, uh, it talks about these bylaws superseding what are still termed the town and village waterbury zoning regulations. We clearly need to update them because they still reference the village. 
but um, those were last enacted in uh, 2016. And they only apply to the downtown zoning district, which has been uh, expanded somewhat from the current downtown commercial zoning district. So uh, we can go over the map. Um, we talked about it a bit uh, a few weeks ago, but we can, uh, I can bring that up uh, after we go through this and show you the area that this would apply to. Uh, but it basically is the downtown. It's all within our downtown design review overlay. And um, there are two sentences at the end that I would like to explain because I think there's some, uh, maybe some misconception and maybe just some um, understanding that um, I'd like to impart, if you will. So under interim bylaws, under the enabling statute, the, the legislative body has uh, quite a bit of authority and act, um, enabled where you, the select board, in, in the case of Waterbury, can review development proposals. You can review new uses. You, you have a lot of authority. And um, so, we, we don't think that's a, a great idea. We think uh, projects need to go through the development review that's board. Bullshit. They, need to, they need to come under uh, these bylaws and the uh, site plan review, conditional use review. So that's why it says here that all use is not specifically allowed in the land land under this interim bylaw are specifically prohibited. So uh, an applicant can't come in and um, under th this draft and say, um, you know, I want to have a, um, you know, a, a rendering factory or something, some, something that, I don't know, I'm just being facetious, but some use that, that um, isn't currently allowed in the downtown and, um, and get the select board to review that. So, um, so the select board review is not available um, under this 4414 uh, or 4415E, which is the section that outlines the criteria that you would use to review those uses. So, so that's the way this is structured. Uh, all uh, projects, it's, in, it's envisioned, would go through the development review board, would be under the, the uses and other uh, criteria and process that's outlined in these bylaws. So, um, I'll move through. So Steve, can I stop yes. you for a second? Sure, go ahead. So, so basically what you're saying is because of new legislative uh, guidelines, they're allowing select boards in towns to have more authority over what their zoning zoning allows. Yeah. But yet what you're saying here is this is a kind of a stopgap measure to prevent that from happening so that we just any and all select boards can't pick and choose what they want to do. You're you're looking to basically kind of hold the zoning regs to to the town plan as a whole. Well, in a sense, yeah, these are based on the municipal plan, but right, it, this would not allow you to approve a use which is not allowed under these interim bylaws. That's bullshit. You know, which could be some you know like a larger industrial use, or it could be. Uh, something else. I'm not. I'm not sure who's commenting in the background, but I ask that everyone mute their mic and please watch your link. We're in a select board meeting. Bill, did you have something you wanted to add, or should I move on? You good to go? No, no I was going to say the same it. thing just, Mark did. Okay, good. Um, All right, so I'm going to move right along. And can't be, it can't be self-serving, is it? Yeah. Right. right. So by all means, we can come back to this if if you like. So. Um, and what I would suggest is we move through this, maybe if, if there's anything clarifying the select board needs to ask, and then um, Mark, I would suggest then we go to the public comment if, if that would work for you. Um, so this outlines the zoning district uh, purpose for the downtown zoning district. This is um, from our unified development bylaw and talks about the historic downtown and the intent to maintain the traditional village pattern of development and um, also being within the downtown design review overlay uh, is shown on the, on the map. There's no changes proposed to the downtown design review bylaws or the, over, or the overlay. So then um, this outlines all the permitted uses and uh, we have a table which defines each of these uses. And um, 
So there's been some comments about the size and uh, once we're through the public hearing, I, I do have some recommendations on how to address some of these comments. Uh, the 2000 square feet is, is from our current uh, zoning regulations. And uh, as I say, we've had some comments about that. You can certainly have some more discussion and uh, I'll have some recommendations later on um, on that. So uh, these are just the different categories of uh, residential uses, lodging, commercial, so when it says a permitted use, that means that uh, the review process is site plan review. And typically with uh, buildings, new buildings, um, renovation of existing buildings, design review is also part of that process to maintain the historic uh, character. There's only one industrial use here that's permitted. That's a communications antenna. It would be like a panel antenna on top of the building or something. WDEV has a number of antennas on top of their um, radio, WDEV radio building and Squires building. Uh, these are the conditional uses. So this outlines all of uh, those uses. They would not only uh, go through site plan review, it would also go through conditional use review. And um, so it, uh, there are these thresholds um, for some of the uses that's currently 2,000 square feet. We can certainly have some discussion in the, with the public and later about uh, these thresholds and possibly uh, modifying that. The um, I'll mention here with the uh, food or beverage manufacturing, this would include a brewery, a cider brewing or beer brewing. Um, so the way this is set up, uh, that use would be allowed up to 5,000 square feet. Uh, over 5,000 would, would not be allowed in this district. It might be allowed, let's say, in the industrial district, probably would be. Uh, like we're uh, over in Pilgrim Park. Light industry, the same, would be allowed up to 5,000 square feet. We have some light industrial uses already in this proposed district on Foundry Street, so they would fall into this category. Uh, there's a few more wholesale trade. Passenger transportation facility, our railroad station is a good example of that. So um, that- Steve, new... Steve, can I stop you for a second? Can you remind, uh, remind us what light industry, how that's defined? Sure. So light industry is typically um, totally enclosed. There's usually no outdoor storage. That's why it says enclosed. Uh, and um, it can be typically industry that does not have a lot of emissions, um, you know, smoke or odor or um, emissions that might negatively impact a residential area uh, nearby residences. So it could include, um, you know, well, a good example is the silkscreen business, which is at 30 Foundry, uh, where they produce, I'm sure, everything from t-shirts to other uh, silkscreen products. So a business like that um, has emissions, but uh, it's under conditional use. So those review, those criteria will, will be reviewed. Does that answer your question, Mark? Okay. Is is some Steve is something like no noise ordinance? Is that also uh, is that noise levels? Is that also part of part that's of part the of conditional, process? Right, that's uh, part of conditional use review. Is noise, odor, um, any impact, and other impacts off site like traffic and so on. In, impact on municipal infrastructure, uh, that that type of thing. Parking is a site plan review criteria, so lighting, um, all of that. So these are the dimensional standards that are proposed. Uh, it's a very small minimum lot size, so it would allow a high density. Uh, we have some very small lots in the downtown, uh, zone, existing downtown commercial zone district. Um, and lot frontage is the, essentially the minimum lot width. Uh, lot coverage, we have buildings in the, in the heart of the downtown that cover 100% of their lot. So this requires 90%. So, um, you know, leave some space for, you know, whether it's a driveway or some access, other uh, service use. Setbacks, these are the same as our current downtown commercial district. Um, we're not recommending any changes to those. We have um, quite a few buildings in the downtown that are at, uh, basically behind the sidewalk or out the right of way that they have no setback or the side or rear setback may, may be, this is a minimum setback though, so it could definitely be more. The build to line 
means if you if you build a new building, it needs to be built um, to within eight feet or less of the sidewalk. So the idea is this is getting into something that's generally termed form-based code, where you identify the size, bulk, placement of buildings. Um, and this is something that's very typical for zoning in downtowns now to require that buildings are built up to um, near the sidewalk. So you basically got a streetscape. You don't have a, a larger area of parking or something else um, in front of the building. So that's the purpose of this bylaw. Uh, built Steve, yeah. Steve, can I ask a question? Uh, we sure. have a lot of like narrow, deep lots. If somebody wanted to split that up, going backwards, are you able to do that with that lot frontage or how does that work in that scenario? Yeah, we allow access to lots by right of way. Um, and that would be facilitated in this district as well. So it could be accessed by a right of way to a real a rear lot. The 2000 square foot minimum allows uh, subdivision of lots. If someone wants to put two buildings on a lot, uh, it facilitates that um, scenario. Um, minimum built to oh the uh, minimum built to line coverage so that's um, the amount of the area along the front that um, is covered by the building so it allows space let's say it's a hundred foot wide lot the um, building would need to be at least sixty feet wide or if it's a fifty foot wide lot building would need to be 50, 30 feet wide so it allows space for a driveway access um, or some an alley or some open space. Um, minimum principal building height, planning commission had quite a bit of discussion about this. It typically would be a minimum two-story building, but it could be a tall one-story building. The idea is that um, we wouldn't allow a new building that would be short and would not be in character with other buildings in the downtown area. Um, and then maximum structure height is, is generous. We have tall buildings in the downtown that are you know, 40, 50 feet tall. So that would allow a tall building and uh, no minimum or maximum residential density. So this is in keeping with the current trend to allow high density residential as well in the downtown, which would typically be apartments, but it could be uh, other kinds of residential development. Um, the, um, it does prohibit uh, food service drive-throughs. This would be a drive-through uh, like a fast food restaurant, a drive up where you drive up and get a takeout order is certainly allowed. Uh, that's not a problem at all, but it would preclude having a drive up window, for instance, with drive through service from the front to the back. Uh, it tends to be a very intensive kind of circulation in, in the downtown. And currently, we do not allow drive throughs for restaurants. We do for banks, and it could be at a drive through pharmacy, something of that nature, but not. Um, not for food service like a restaurant. Um, the definition, this just talks about the definitions in the uh, use table, and we'll get to the use table in a minute. Uh, and these new definitions would supersede the matching definitions in the zoning bylaws. So this is designed to dovetail with the existing bylaws. Um, and um, where they're not defined, common language uh, would would control that situation. So I'm going to move right along, and then we can come come back to um, any of this once we get into the comment period. So this is the um, the use tables. This lists all of the um, different uses. Actually, this is based on the Unified Development Bylaw, so it lists all the uses. You'll see some of them are not allowed, but it'll, it will allow us to add uh, districts in the future in these columns as we build on this. Uh, what, um, so this talks about the single family dwelling, uh, other kinds of residential uses that are allowed, accessory dwellings, we'll talk about that um, in a little bit, uh, home occupations, home businesses. Um, there are some review standards for, um, for some of these uses, family daycare, uh, assisted living, uh, the lodging uses are defined, bed and breakfasts, uh, which are accessory to a single family residential property, uh, inns, which are um, no more than 12 guests 
bedrooms and uh, short term rentals are allowed, but it's a very generous uh, definition. Uh, it just says an accessory use of the property to provide short term guest accommodation. So that's um, not restrictive, if you will, um, at this stage of the game, Airbnb, that type of rental. Hotel or motel, this is allowed as a conditional use. The P's and the C's, what that means is the P is a permitted use, would just require site plan review. The C is conditional use, which requires both site plan review and um, conditional use review. If you see a, a, a P and a C with a vertical line, that then it um, it requires, <clears throat> excuse me, that you go over to the, uh, let me see if I can enlarge this a, a little bit. Um, now I'm having a little trouble with that. Um, okay, I'm just going to move through this rather than trying to re reformat it at this point. Um, so where there's a P and a C with a vertical line, you'll see over in the definition where we have retail sales, um, for this current draft up to 2,000 square feet would be a P, over 2,000 square feet would be conditional use. So this allows us to review a larger project with a larger impact um, as a conditional use, just to address um, any issues with that in, impact. So again, we can have some discussion later about this. Uh, you know, we may want to you may want to consider upping this um, threshold, if you will, at the two thousand square feet. Um, okay. So I'm not going to go through all the uses. You'll see some are not allowed. The X means it's not allowed. So. Um, or repairs like vehicle repairs not allowed, a fueling station, gas stations not allowed, lumber yard. These are, you know, more high intensity uses that will be allowed in other districts, but not in this area. Um, open market, like a farmer's market, um, would would be allowed. Um, and then office professional, again, we've got to split up this 2,000 square feet with a, a P and a C. Uh, again, restaurants, uh, there would be a, a division there. Um, event facility and nightclubs, uh, this is listed as a separate definition where you could have corporate meetings. Hang on. Sorry, the lights went out on me. Uh, so I'll go into the industrial uh, uses. Uh, food and beverage manufacturing, I mentioned that this would include uh, both food manufacturing, such as Sunja's uh, at 40 Foundry, or um, beverage manufacturing, such as a, a brewery, and where that would be a primary use in a building. And this would be allowed up to uh, 5,000 square feet on a given property. And then above that 5,000, it would not be allowed. It'd be a conditional use to evaluate um, any emissions um, that. Uh, impacts of that nature. Light industrial, um, again, up to 5,000 would be allowed, closed. Over 5,000 would not, not be allowed. You can see the X on this side. Um, you know, oh, Steve, can I ask yeah, a quick question? Uh, back in the food and beverage manufacturing, um, I know that when the alchemist first came into Waterbury up there, well, they moved from where the pro pig is now up to uh, the crossroad. Um, we had some significant issues with uh, with the the disposal of the uh, the ingredients to make the uh, make the beer. Um, I mean, that really caused a rift there for quite some time um, with the neighbors. Uh, are the are these regs, uh, the process in which that would have to go through um, would be looked at, those types of issues would be looked at along with whatever else has to go with, with that process? Correct. So um, yeah, any processing type issues like that, um, yeah, disposal of uh, materials to be recycled could be part of a conditional use review and site plan review, looking at service of a building and, and so on. Um, I mean, I remember they had some pretty serious rat infestation issues up there 
Yeah. One, at one point and uh, yeah, I think those have been resolved. We work with them around okay. that process. And so, yeah, I think the brewing in the downtown that we anticipate that the scale is such that it's more of a manageable, uh, okay. that those types of issues are more manageable. Yeah. So, okay, so I'm gonna move Steve. through this, uh, slow me down. If, um, Steve. Oh, Bill, you've got some comment? Yes, go ahead. Just a question in terms of um, being consistent. Can you scroll back down so we can see the, the food and beverage again? Yeah. This is just a minor picky thing, but under light industrial, you've got the C with a vertical line and an X. Right. Shouldn't you have that with the food and beverage as well, just to yeah. just to be you know consistent? Yeah, I would recommend that. Do a C with a vertical line and an X, and over here have a right. uh, up to five thousand a vertical line, and then over five. Yeah, that's one of my okay. recommended changes. And then um, just a, another question: You don't have to go back, but for the residential uses, <clears throat> it's hard to read the fine print. Is it is it necessary under the um, state law now that we talk about single family, single family with accessory? Uh, two family, three and four family, and then multifamily. Is it? Is there really a big difference between a three and four family and a multifamily? Well, this goes to the other districts, and I'd like um, you know I'd have to defer to the planning. Okay. Committee. Well, if it um, if it has to do with other districts, then that's fine. Yeah. It, when we get know, into I just the, was curious about it now, so that's yeah. okay. When Don't we get into our residential it. districts, those those come more into play. That's fine. To facilitate more. Um, Medium size, yeah, multi family, if you will. Yeah, if that has to do with another district, we don't have to talk about it. Oh, okay, yeah. Um, all right, so let me get through the rest of these and then we'll spend a little time on the special uh, use standards and then open it up to the public. So, um, okay. So I think what I'd like to do is go down through these other uses fairly quickly, and we can come back to these if you like. Um, art, entertainment, and recreation talks about um, different types of theaters, uh, social clubs, like um, the American Legion would be a social club, artist gallery or studio, like Makersphere, um, museum facilities, indoor recreation, which could be a gym, something of that nature, a fitness center, uh, like up on Route 100, that would be an indoor recreation facility. Outdoor recreation, uh, this would be a private type of uh, facility, not a public park, but a, a private uh, kind of facility, which you know, we really don't have space for in the, in the downtown. Um, specialty schools are allowed on a small scale, up to 5,000 uh, square feet uh, indoor. Uh, we have the uh, adult learning center, for instance, is, exists in the downtown area. Um, civic and community uses, um, you know, we've got government facilities. Uh, they're allowed as a permitted use parks. Here we have farmer's market. So an open market would be a little different, I guess. Farmer's market's allowed as a permitted use. Um, educational institutions are, are uh, state certified public or private. Uh, schools so include the primary school and, and any potential private school. Uh, clinics would be allowed as a conditional use, uh, medical clinics, and then uh, churches and so on. Uh, funeral homes, like um, the Perkins Park funeral home, certainly allowed as a permitted use. Uh, these are the dimensional requirements um, that are the same as what I went over in the table. I don't think I'm gonna uh, go over them again. Uh, they're just repeated in a table form so we can add other districts uh, as the uh, planning commission works on developing permanent bylaws for other districts. The specific use standards are uh, additional criteria for uh, some of the uses. Um, if, if there's not a specific use standard for a use in the table, then it would be just the site plan review and conditional use um, standards. Um, multifamily, there was a question about bulk storage. This is not uh, refuse and recyclable. This would be um, more of a secured area where people could store additional items that they have. 
So that provides a minimum, talks about pedestrian access for multifamily, uh, talks about mixed use buildings where there are uh, commercial and residential uses combined. And um, we do allow mixed use in the downtown zoning district. We do, this is proposed to allow uh, residential on the first floor as well. Some communities require commercial on the first floor and um, that we don't feel is progressive. We feel that's up to the development community to propose uh, an appropriate mix that works on their particular site. So some site may be exclusively uh, residential and that's that's fine if that's what the market is, is driving. So this allows, um, um, allows a mix and talks a little bit about open space and screening. Uh, let's talk a little bit about accessory dwelling units. This is a use by right under state statutes and um, they have to be located within or pertinent to an owner occupied single family dwelling. That's the requirement in, um, in state statutes. Um, and as I say, they are use by right. Um, the planning commission decided to make this more um, Progressive, if you will, and allow up to two bedrooms. Also allow it to be either uh, not exceeding 1,400 square feet or 50% of the habitable floor area of the primary dwelling. So this is really designed for single family dwellings and um, is, as I say, more liberal or more permissive than our current uh, accessory dwelling bylaw, which is good. We wanna encourage the development of accessory dwelling units. They can be in a separate accessory building like a, over a garage uh, something of that nature that's certainly allowed steve what uh, happens if the owner decides to leave but maintains ownership of the property well that's a good question um you know we it, it is required to be owner occupied so presumably it would have to come back into a a, a permit process um in other words uh the, it might have to be permitted as a separate building um, because this is a state a requirement in state statute. So, uh, you know, with small lot size in the downtown zoning district, that might not be a problem. You know, a garage could potentially be on its own lot, but this is the requirement in state statute. So, if it's permitted that way, uh, the single family dwelling has to be owner occupied, or it would have to come in for a, sub, a, a new zoning permit. Is how we would try to handle that. Does that answer your question? Isn't that yeah, a, isn't, Mark's point there? Isn't that a way of just somebody circumventing the process? Well, yeah. <laughs> you know, we're required to, to allow this. So, um, you know, someone could, you know, leave town and then rent their house. Is that the scenario you're thinking of? And then, you know, is it no longer an accessory dwelling? Well, if they don't live there, you're correct. It's no longer an accessory dwelling. If, um, you know, the zoning administrator gets that information, they'd have to address that through with the owner and have them permit the apartment as a separate primary use. I think that's how we would have to deal with that. Yeah, I would just want to make sure that there's a clean path to that and not a scenario that, um, you know, an owner feels forced to sell because they were in the ADU yeah. scenario and then yeah. can't figure out a path out of it. Right. In this district, I don't think it would be a problem because typically 2,000 square feet, um, you know, typically you could put a garage maybe on its own lot. But an owner needs to think about that when they permit accessory dwelling. You know, if they intend on selling down the road, they have to think about that. So, um, so can I ask one other stupid question? So if, if they're able to do that and so-called circumvent the process, why do we require those types of regulations, why can't you just allow dwellings to be set, you know, occupied without primary owners? I mean, it's because unless there's a penalty of some sort uh, or leaving yeah, or some form of, you know, because ultimately you're going to give them a permit for another separate dwelling, right? It's almost like Right. Well, you know, it could be, it would be more of an issue in a rural area with a, let's say a two acre lot and a two acre 
um, minimum lot size district where someone has a garage and wants an accessory dwelling over it, then we're required to allow them to do that as long as they have wastewater. We don't have a choice. So, um, so I think the answer to your question is this is something we have to have. If somebody wants to circumvent the zoning, then they're going to have to figure out a way to permit it. If they can't permit it, that's an issue. So people have to understand going into developing an accessory dwelling that this is the requirement. It's very clear in the permit. So um, you know, some things the state mandates, and this is one of them. So that's for better or for worse, that's my answer. <laughs> yep. Steve, ultimately, yeah. if you have a situation where you have someone in the primary unit and you have an accessory unit and they for whatever reason need to leave the primary unit. Can't you then consider it as a multifamily residence if it if it's okay to permit it as such as two units? Right, right, Mike. If it's if it's in the same building, it could be a duplex, and that's allowed in any district on a minimum. I'm looking level. at a separate, like say you have, as you were saying, you have the primary house, and then you have kind of a garage, kind of uh, you know, accessory, you know, mother daughter kind of you know unit like that. Right. Well, if it's if it's not an accessory dwelling, it would have to be permitted as a primary use or a single family dwelling. So mm -hmm. that's that's the answer. And it would have we you'd have to be able to demonstrate that it could sit on its own lot, separate lot. You don't have to subdivide, but you have to be able to demonstrate that you could subdivide. So it's something okay. that people need to think about when they permit these. Yeah. Okay. So home occupations, we currently allow, um, I know Mike, you had a comment about the 35% uh, habitable floor area. That's our current bylaw. Um, the 900 square feet applies to, uh, let's say you have your, your home occupation in your garage, a, a wood shop or an office or something of that nature. So that would just apply to having your home occupation accessory um, building. Um, there's two uses in this um, group, in this district, that require uh, performance standards. This is something that the Planning Commission um, asked, wanted to have included. So you'll see Section 1607 is performance standards. Those additional standards only apply to a home occupation or a home business. And we'll talk about the home business in a minute. So home occupations uh, do not require site plan approval, it's an administrative permit. That's how it is now. As long as you meet these criteria, um, the zoning administrator can issue you a permit. Uh, however, uh, you would have to meet these performance standards and they have to do with noise, odor, things of that nature. And we'll talk about those in, in just a minute. The home business is a new use that we've had, uh, we being the planning commission and I have had a lot of uh, discussion about. I think it's a really good idea. Uh, this would be allowed in virtually every um, every district. So, um, and the home business is, is a step above the home occupation. It is, um, would have to be uh, related to an owner-occupied home. And uh, there are criteria, including the performance standards here. So this would be a more involved use. They can have more employees. It could be a um, could be a building contractor who um, you know maybe um, you know has uses their garage as a home base for their uh, their business and and so on. This does require site plan review. So you know um, there could be screening if there's um, any kind of outdoor uh, storage that type of thing. And it's um, limited to no more than 50% of the habitable floor area of the dwelling. Um, but it may occupy any amount of space in one or more accessory dwellings. So, uh, so there's a lot of flexibility. And I think um, we have a lot of these kinds of uses in our community. I think it's a really good idea to, to uh, allow that, facilitate that. And um, we can look at these performance standards in just, in just a minute. So this would have to go through the development review board under site plan review and approval to deal with parking, landscaping, screening. Um, a family child care home is a use by right in um, in Vermont. Uh, there, uh, this is, would be a licensed um, family child care home or home daycare center, and uh, it's limited 
to um, no more than six children on a full-time basis and um, no more than four on a part-time basis, which would be like after school kids. And um, so it's considered an accessory use. The residential property does not require site plan review. So this is more permissive than our current, we currently uh, require site plan reviews. This is a setup where as a zoning administrator could permit a home daycare as long as it meets these criteria and it is licensed by the state. And we have um, quite Steve, a Steve, yeah. question for you on that. Sure. Would that be also a registered child care business? Correct. Yeah, registered. I think now I think registered and licensed um, would be interchangeable. Um, they are very different though. Okay. Well, <laughs> that's something maybe we should talk about. Should it say licensed or registered? Absolutely. Okay. Okay. Uh, good. Because it, it, it's 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 very different in the way that the the state looks at child care. Okay. And does registered have the same limit on numbers of kids if it's a home registered Correct. daycare? Correct. Okay. All right. Good. Well, we could easily uh, let's make a note that we would want to add registered there. Um, so the uh, residential care home is um, a group home, and this is also a use by right. And um, this is, uh, you'll see, if we went back to the definition, you'd see it's for uh, people with a disability. Um, we just had a conversation with our Vermont Fire Association Legislative Committee today about this, because there's some new legislation being discussed. It does include a, um, well, recovering uh, drug users are considered, uh, that's considered a disability. So a group home could be a, a so-called sober house or um, a um, recovery home. Um, so that's something to keep in mind that that is, is a use by right under the state definition for a um, residential group home. It is a, a form of, uh, disability or uh, eligible uh, use of this type of facility. So bed and breakfast, um, I think that's pretty much what you would think of. There were some, uh, it's um, accessory to a single family dwelling and it's limited to no more than four bedrooms. Otherwise it goes into this in category. The uh, bed and breakfast uh, needs to require guest parking and meet the minimum parking requirements. And um, now I know there was a comment, I think Mike, you had a comment about bed and breakfast being considered. Um, uh, what about uh, not, where it says not offer meals to the general public? So that's because it's accessory to a single family dwelling. If a facility offers meals to the public, and this would be true of an inn as well, uh, there would be a restaurant use that would have to be considered. Uh, so that allows us to review um, additional parking that might be needed, also sewer and water allocation for a restaurant and so on. So uh, that's the reason that it's, it's limited here to the uh, <coughs> breakfast, if you will, for the guests. But my question is, and, and was where I pose, is that you may see some small bed and breakfast that they may look at an accessory to their business that they may might want to serve breakfasts and I don't know I guess I don't have a problem with you know if if, if they only cater to a, you know less than four people that if they have a small eating area that they can have you know some some guests in for paid breakfast just another way for people to earn money yeah I, I understand what you're saying Mike I think I think it's kind of a slippery slope I think you know I understand looks at this in more detail. I think that's a good topic to keep in our to-do list to discuss further. Um, I, I think in this stage of the game, um, we have to be careful because someone could turn their house into a restaurant basically. And understand. as a bed and breakfast. So I think uh, we wouldn't have a problem, but th they would have to permit it as some type of a restaurant use. And then we can address water and sewer allocation, parking, you know, it does just, not require site plan review and approval. So it's just COVID's 
changed a lot of things yeah. the way that we do business and you're going to see a lot more people looking at some creative ways and i don't think it's something that's kind of would be against what our town plan and what we might want to see in our town plan, you know, be done, you know, and maybe again, cause this is interim, it's probably not going to have a real big effect because it's, it's really for the next two years. Yeah. We can look at that further as we for, go. A, for a long-term, you know, by, you know, bylaw review. Sure. Absolutely. That, that sounds fine. So in end, uh, this would have, excuse me, yeah. can I just say something to that? I think Mike, this is Martha Staskis. Um, I think you should keep in mind, though, that if you're implementing interim bylaws that have a set of criteria that you think you might not like later <laughs> or want to change, um, you will have permitted, you will have enabled permitting of uses that once the bylaws are issued, then make them non compliant. So just think about it carefully <laughs> before you say it's just a temp. Don't, I just don't think you want to be thinking about it as temporary. Totally understand, Martha. It's, it's something long-term. And I think, you know, if you, you know, maybe that's prudent is to not open the door now. And then when we look at future bylaw, you know, zoning changes, that may be something to look at. Well, back in, at the beginning of this discussion, I was going to bring up that same scenario, but a little bit in reverse. If you allow those things in the interims and then you take it away on the final draft, you might get it thrown in your face that you had let That's people from point. the last previous two years yeah. get away with this. And now you're saying, I can't. Yeah. You got to be yeah. careful. You gotta I be think careful. that's a good, a good point, Chris. I think we do need to be cautious. You're absolutely right. Um, so the inn is um, limited to not more than 12 bedrooms. And um, again, an inn can offer uh, meals and other services, meeting rooms and so on to the guests as an accessory use, that's fine. Um, has to provide parking and so on, but um, it uh, would not um, allow meals for uh, the general public as I, as I recall, I'm just looking to see where that's um, identified here. But um, yeah, an inmate offer meals to the guests as, uh, as allowed accessory uses. So if these services are offered to the general public, they must be reviewed as separate uses, such as a restaurant use or a, a fitness um, center use or something of that nature. And again, we can talk about this more as we look at at these as permanent bylaws to see if we want to make it more permissive. Uh, Short-term rentals we discussed briefly. Hotel, motel. You know, downtowns often have hotels and motels. Uh, would be in excess of 12 rooms with an extended stay, and this provides a lot more, um, you know, flexibility in terms of um, other kinds of uses that might be associated, so that they may include uses such as a restaurant, event venues. Uh, fitness and, and so on. However, those uses shall be reviewed as separate uses, not as accessory uses under the applicable zoning. So again, um, it's not opening the door to, um, you know, a use like a restaurant without that going through the proper review, um, through sewer and water allocation and, and so on, all that would be required. The um, open market or auction house, sometimes these these exist in, in buildings where someone will have a, an auction in, a, in an existing building in a downtown. And um, so um, it outlines the, the bylaws that would apply it to be a seasonal use and, and so on, uh, put some parameters around that use. Uh, the restaurant bar use, um, I wanted to highlight a couple things about the restaurant bar here. Um, so, uh, you know, any outdoor seating has to be identified. Uh, that's the way we normally do this, whether it's uh, Gen Barn or the former TD Bank building. Um, not have recorded or amplified music uh, outside uh, within an open air structure unless approved by the Development Review Board. And then any live music occurring 
on the site, either inside or out, would require the issuance of a town zone entertainment permit by the um, select board. So we make that clear. And then we talk a little bit about soundproofing and, um, and whatnot. Um, now, one thing um, in the definition, uh, this does allow a uh, microbrewery as an accessory use under certain parameters. So you could have the primary use of the restaurant bar. And um, as soon as we get to the bottom, I'd like to go back to that just so you understand. We want to allow a brew pub type restaurant where the restaurant's the primary use and they have a brewing uh, a brewery in association with that. So that's another option. I'll get back to that in a minute. So mobile food service, this would be like uh, Katya's uh, ice cream cart or um, you know, other mobile food service that would not uh, be permitted under our vendor ordinance. So this would be on a private site. Uh, we have permitted these um, in the past through zoning and uh, just provide some parameters around that mobile food service. Um, you know, we have inquiries about this and we want to facilitate uh, this type of, uh, of a use in the downtown as well. Uh, event facility nightclub, we talked a little bit about that. Uh, and that would be limited to not having um, outdoor seating except as shown on the site plan. And then it limits uh, amplified sound system playing outside of enclosed building unless otherwise approved. So the development review board can put limits on, uh, on the sound levels and, and whatnot. Um, the performance standards we talked about, <clears throat> so these would apply only to home occupations and home businesses under this interim bylaw. Uh, they wouldn't apply to any of the other businesses. So it talks about noise, uh, glare from windows, uh, odors, emissions of odors that could be uh, detectable outside of the property line. Typically, they're limit, these things are limited to impacts that go beyond the uh, property boundary. So it's not limiting what could take place within a property boundary. Um, you know, vibration from instruments, uh, waste material storage, particular matter. I don't think the particular matter airborne solids is talking about wood stoves. It's talking about um, dust, um, you know, that could be from some sort of a, a facility in a home business, for instance, um, and generating smoke that uh, would affect an off, um, off-site property. So this would be related to most likely a home business, but it could be related to a home occupation as well. And then enforcement and the zoning map. So um, I just wanted to go back briefly to the restaurant. Um, so we're clear on that. Um, and you kind of have the full picture. So that would be under commercial uses. So right here under restaurant, and um, this is probably a little hard for you to see, but um, what it says is, um, let's see. I thought that it had a, um, in the definition, I thought there was some allowance for, um, Right here, right here under 1606-13, uh, this use okay. also includes an establishment that primarily, I can't hardly read it myself, but prepares and serves alcohol beverage for immediate consumption. Yeah, here it is, Chris. So yeah. there's a sentence right here in the table. It says, this definition includes a brew pub, <coughs> excuse me, a brew pub that produces less than 15,000 barrels of alcoholic beverage per year and sells 25% or more of its beverage on premises. So, um, so this would be where the restaurant's the primary use, but there would be a brewery as part of it that's limited to this quantity of uh, barrels per year and this level of, um, of sales on site. Um, so it's another avenue where a, um, a restaurant that wants to have a, a brew, brewery in conjunction with the restaurant could um, could do that. So I just wanted to point that out. How many gallons in a barrel? Any idea? 
55? I don't know. I'm 30, 30, 30, 30, 31. 31. Thank you, Mark. You're the brewer here in the group. Okay, thank you. So Mark, unless you want to look at the map, that's that's really all I have at this point. Um, yeah, I'd like to bring up the map and I think I'm going to make a similar comment I made last time, but I would like everyone who's on the meeting to be able to look at the map. Okay, hang on. Okay, so um, so this is the map that, um, this is the proposed uh, zoning map <clears throat> and the pink area that I'm outlining is the proposed uh, downtown zoning district. <clears throat> the northwestern end is the same as our current downtown commercial district. Um, this is the gas station at the top of, of Bank Hill. Uh, this is the, um, the building where Mansfield Orthopedics is. Um, the uh, reservoir restaurants right here, Simpson Graves building is here. Goes up, this is 28 Stowe Street right here. Uh, then it takes in uh, the area down around Foundry Street, all of those uh, properties, 30, 40 Foundry, the Stone Shed are included um, <clears throat> and includes all the properties fronting on South Main Street all the way down past the park to Warren Court. Uh, this is the horseshoe in front of the state complex. So on the south side, it goes to the horseshoe and on the north side, it goes to the, uh, the, the first property across from the, um, the Horseshoe Drive where the, where the first turn goes in. And then it takes in Moody Court and uh, the, um, the Washington County Mental Health Building on Moody Court is included and the other residences that are on Moody Court. And then uh, the rest of, the, of these zoning districts all remain as they currently exist, the, the black line and the uh, green line that I'm outlining are the, are the design review overlay district. This is the campus overlay. So um, all these other districts for now would remain the same. So these interim regs only pertain to the area in purple? Only to this area in the purple or pink, correct? Steve, Steve or someone from the Planning Commission, can, can you explain again why, as we ex look at expanding south on Main Street, that we're not considering the north section of Main Street? I just feel like it's outside of the floodplain. It's connected to the downtown. It's bound by the railroad. It just seems like that is an area of opportunity versus risking you know, more density and development and maybe some of these floods prone areas. And, and I was just wondering why, I'm sure it was discussed and I'm wondering why the decision was to not expand that way as well. Uh, Mark, I don't know that we did discuss it specifically. Um, you know, a lot of our discussions pertaining to this particular zoning district, a lot of the time was spent on um, the use regulations and what the thresholds might be between what would be considered to be um, a use that would be permitted either administratively or by site plan review or what would be um, uh, relegated to conditional review. So I, I don't, if we did, I don't recall it. it if we could have a long time ago, um, our work on this zoning district was, um, some of it goes back a while ago, and then we had been focusing on other parts of town before we came back to it. And then, of course, we've had the interruptions of the pandemic and all of that in the past year. So I, I, I wish I had a better answer for you, but that's the best I got. Mark, I'll, I'll just offer a little, and maybe other planning commission members want to jump in. So the proposal for these areas in the yellow is called the mixed use district. Um, it is a higher density district that does allow some commercial uses, uh, but it's not as intense as the downtown where you have zero setbacks, you have no density limit on residential. This is a very intense district that I think needs to be fairly concentrated. But um, I think as the planning commission looks at this mixed use district, uh, and I'd encourage them to do that, you know, in the next round. Um, we can look at 
at what's appropriate in that area to mix with these other residential uses. But I think the character is somewhat different. And I think we have to be careful not to apply this uh, high density, the allowing some limited um, light industrial kinds of uses in these other areas that are, have a much higher concentration of residences. So that, that's, that's my short answer. Yeah, I kind of agree with you, Steve, there at this point, I, you know, and I understand your point too as well, Mark, being out of the flood zones, certainly preferable. Um, but I guess my question to myself is, ultimately it may happen over time, um, the way it may evolve, but uh, do we want to shove out all the residential out of the village, you know, I mean, and, and turn it completely into uh, business district. Um, I was going to ask you wh which square here, Steve, would be Bourne's, uh, Bourne's I property? Think, I think Bourne's is right down around here, Chris. Yeah. Uh, it's just before you get to Winooski Street. I think it's this large parcel that I'm outlining down here. Yeah. So, yeah, Chris, my, my actual interest is more of the idea of building residential density in the downtown and getting it out of the floodplain area. So I'm not interested in that turning into businesses as much as it's an op potentially an opportunity because those lots are so deep to find more residential locations that may be a, a, a easier to convince someone to buy and invest in developing it and, and not having to run into the regulations surrounding flood um, when trying to build build out the, the project. That'd definitely be more affordable residential for sure. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's the intent here, Mark, with this mixed use district would be a, allow a much higher density than what's currently allowed. Yeah, I, I agree that section north of Stowe Street has a little bit different character. It's not nearly as, as dense. And yes, in the next round, we may want to look at some other, you know, you know, protections and some other maybe loosening up to do different things, but it's it's a little bit different animal than the purple section. Mark, did you want to open this up for some public comment? I can I can take away my screen share unless you have more questions about the map. I have one quick question before we go to public. Um, the density change, are we saying there's a minimum size? I know that small format kind of tiny house living is trending, but also is there any kind of limit to how small? I mean, I feel like there needs to be some kind of minimum housing size. You know, I think you had a calculation on one section that was like one per 400 square feet. I don't, I don't know. Is there any limitation? Could you build 50 square foot units? It just seems like there's something there. Yeah, we, we've never had a minimum dwelling size. Um, I think we pretty much let the market drive what, um, you know, what a private um, landowner wants to have for the dwelling. But the Planning Commission has had a lot of discussion about cottage type development. I think we want to allow smaller units, but um, I, I don't know that I would recommend a, a, a small small size. I think the market is, is going to drive that. That's okay. my personal view, but we could look at that down the line. Um, do we want to talk about, before we go to public, about the 2,000 square feet and 5,000 square foot thresholds and how those were determined and and why we're at those thresholds? Sure. Let me, let me take away the screen share. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I can give you my viewpoint. I think it'd be interesting to hear from the public on that too. Are you asking me for my perspective or do you want me to wait? Yeah, because I, I know it's going to come up and, you know, a 2,000 square foot restaurant, just because I'm in the business, is small. Um, and, you know, then we jump up in these other ones to these 5,000 thresholds, which I'm just wondering what the basis is, what those numbers are off. I know there are some buildings, including one that I have on Foundry, that's say 10,000 square feet. So that would not allow someone in that building to get the 10,000 square feet. And I know there's some other buildings in the area in this district that I just want to make sure that there is a path to growth within these buildings before they'd be forced out of the downtown. Um, so I don't know. Right. So 
the planning commission had a lot of discussion about scale in the downtown. I think this this goes to that issue of scale. Now, um, I would be in support of changing the 2,000 foot threshold to a 5,000 foot threshold, um, where you move from a permitted use to a conditional use for those uses. Um, I would not recommend anything more than 5,000 square feet for the food and beverage manufacturing or the light industry. I think we really run the risk of having a business that would overwhelm the, the residential use in the area. Um, you know, in a building, you could have multiple uses that were each, each use would need to be under 5,000 square feet. So it doesn't preclude a 10,000 square foot building having one use that's under 5,000 and a different use that's also under 5,000 or, or multiple uses. So that, that's kind of my recommendation. I, when we're done with the public hearing, I can show you what, uh, what I would recommend, but I think it'd be good to, for you to hear from the public and I don't want to um, you know, step on any toes there. But since you asked, that's my rec that, that's yep. where I would head with it. But that's okay. Um, well, we'll yeah. open it up to the public. Um, I'm not sure. I'm not in the chat, so um, I'm not yeah. sure. And I haven't been reading these messages. Um, does anyone want to kick off the public feedback portion while I read through some of my direct messages? Mm -hmm. I would just suggest people go off mute and speak up. I think sure. there is a there is a reaction button at the bottom of your screen, and you can put your hand up. You can wave if you want to raise hand. There's a raise hand actually button. That's another good way if someone wants to be recognized. Mark. Okay. Um, Jason, it looks like you are getting ready to talk. So if you'd like to go ahead and start us off. Sure. Um, I just first of all say thank you. I mean, I know you all have put in a ton of work, Steve a ton planning commission and bill and the select board for, for taking this up I, I really appreciate it uh, you know i do think we're all aware or have realized how the, the the zoning rules that were made in 1996 are, are having problems particularly in in the uses and how they're defined i think um, our economy is certainly evolving what we think of as retail is is, is no longer a really viable business um, even um, you know, in my experience, in my personal experience, um, you know, office is changing and so forth. And there's no question that COVID is having a real meaningful and immediate impact on what those uses and what a viable use is downtown. So I, I really do appreciate um, you doing this and, and, and thinking about this um, and looking particularly at the use table. Um, you know, I know there's some concern that this process was rushed um, and, I just feel like every day that we're enforcing the rules that were created in 1996, um, we're uh, making a tacit endorsement of those. Those are in fact limiting uh, businesses in, in our community right now. Um, and I think to the extent that these rules take us a step further, I think that's great. And I think it gives the planning commission more time to, to do the right thing and really evaluate the rules and, and, and develop ones that they are 100% uh, confidence in um, for the long term. Um, so I, I think that this um, is, a, is a good thing. Um, I, I did share some comments via email with you guys a couple of week, weeks ago, but at just a high level, and, and, and I think I've softened them a little bit. Um, the first one refers to that uh, section 1602 applicability. Steve, you brought it up. Um, the comments that all use is not specifically allowed or specifically prohibited, and no select board review is available for such prohibited uses. I just feel like the, the, the objective of these uh, regulations were to facilitate a, di a diverse mix of uses, higher diversity. Uh, we've seen the problems with these really strict definition of a use table. I, I don't know why we would want to limit that in a time when things are changing so rapidly. So I just think that I, you know, the, the select board is, is an elected uh, committee. I, I think that I wouldn't want to limit that. Um, that's my personal view. Um, my second comment, I think you got, you just approached it, Mark, on the, the use in dimensional tables. Again, I, I advocated for having, you know, the, the current tables, as, as you said, I think are more strict than what are, are currently on the books. For example, office space over 2000 is now conditional under the new interim bylaws where it would be permitted under the old regulations. 
uh, restaurant over 2000 uh, as well. So um, I, I think we need to reestablish a, a, a number. I threw out 5,000 square foot is what's permitted, even if it's 4,000 or something lower. I, I think something more than 2,000, 2,000 seems very small. It's less than the, the size of a footprint for a lot of buildings. Um, and for me, I think that they should be standardized. I mean, as we said, we're having a real hard time. You know, I'm thinking about my own use. Is it a restaurant or is it a food and beverage manufacturing and so forth? So to the extent that they're, you know, we're having a similar threshold, it reduces the amount of gaming in the system that we're going to classify it as one use versus another. I mean, for all these commercial uses, it, to me, it seems like if it's under 3,000, 4,000 square feet, it should be permitted. If it's over 3,000, 4,000, it should be a, a conditional use. Um, and then they can evaluate, you know, if a industrial or light a food manufacturing, you know, facility that's 6,000 uh, square feet makes sense in the village or not. Um, and then the only other comment I made, and, and maybe it's not worth uh, approaching at this time, uh, but it's just around parking. Um, you know, I, I think that that is the, the off street parking requirements is one of the biggest inhibitors to dense um, development, particularly dense uh, residential development. Um, you know, um, Jacob Hemmerich from the Vermont um, Community of Planning does not suggest uh, having an off street parking requirement. You know, to me, I don't see the need to, uh, I see more risk of what we're doing in preventing. Um, uh, more development uh, from having that. But again, that's something, probably something to take at a different point in time, but I thought I would uh, make that comment made. Um, and so just in summary, I, I, you know, I, I think these are a step in the right direction. I think they, there's room for some improvement. Um, and hopefully uh, that gives a planning commission more time and an and opportunity to, to really make uh, long lasting uh, regulations. Yeah, thanks. Jason, if you wouldn't mind, there, I kind of lost you there a little bit when you were talking about the, the, the ability of the select board making decisions. Can you go back over that, what you meant by that? Because I you kind of went out on us there. Sure. And, 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 and I might need to have Steve help me out a little bit about on this because he, he talked about this too. This is in the section 1602, um, the, what is it, the applicability. And there's um, the two sentences that Steve referred to. Um, first, that specifically all uses not specifically allowed in the downtown zoning district are specifically prohibited. And then the second sentence is no select board review is available for such prohibited uses under these standards. And again, I, I just think the challenge with defining these uses, I mean, they, it has caused so many issues where somebody defines a use one way, someone defines a use another, one zoning administrator defines it one way, somebody else defines it the other. I don't know why we would specifically handcuff ourselves to that. Um, but that's my so, point. To your point, my, my concern about allowing the select board, if I'm understanding it correctly, or not allowing the select board to make those decisions is because there could be the potential for self-serving interests from people getting on the board. Um, that'd be my only concern there. Um, and, and that exists. It exists in in the zoning administration. It exists all over the place. And, and and that is a you know in municipal local government that's that's a real risk. This is and Steve, please correct me if I'm wrong, but this is a specifically a a right that is allowed under state statute and that you're specifically um, saying that we don't want to accept that right. Is that is that correct, Steve? So it's something that's under interim bylaws. So it's not something that's allowed under standard permanent bylaws. The select board does not have that authority. And I think they're given this authority because sometimes there are emergency situations that communities find themselves in where they may want to have that flexibility. But um, you know, this we had a legal review of these bylaws, and this was the recommendation of the municipal attorney um, to limit the select board authority. I think the development review board is the body that um, should have the authority to make determinations on these kinds of uses. Um, and there is an appeal process if um, you know if an applicant doesn't agree with the zoning administrator's decision. So. So that goes to the development review board. And I think that's the appropriate uh, board that they have the 
to experience and whatnot to kind of adjudicate these issues. So that that that's just where the uh, kind of where we landed as far as um, the the staff recommendation on this issue. Because otherwise, I think it puts the select board in a very awkward position if development comes to them and they're you know maybe under pressure. So. <laughs> I would I would just counter that. I mean, I've been in two circumstances where I, I can't speak for the, the development review board, but I feel like they did not have the ability to adjudicate as, as you, you suggested and, and that they are confined to very specific rules as well. And by putting these sentences in the bylaws, you, you are limiting flexibility um, and, and that the DRV is, is not free to say, oh, we will allow that use because we think it's okay. That's that's outside of the purview of what the DRB can can do. Yeah, I think what I would suggest is this is a really good issue for the planning commission to discuss. We do have language in the, in the Unified Development Bylaw that addresses uses that aren't allowed and does provide the Development Review Board some flexibility um, in these cases where a definition isn't clear. So I think this is a very good point. Um, but I don't think under the interim bylaws, that's the place to do it. And it, it would put that authority in the development review board, but, but provide them with some guidance and some flexibility to make judgments about where situations where a definition may not be clear. Okay, Jason, thank you. And I, I think we hear you on that concern. So um, it can definitely be discussed more. Um, I'm gonna move on. Um, I'd like to go to William. I see your comment here, but um, if you wanna, ask the question to the group and, and see if we can help you with some answers. But I, I think from your comment, I think these are actually creating the ability to create more units in the airspace and land than previously. Previously, there was a limitation of 15 units per building and some other rules. So I think that actually is addressed in these, but go ahead with your question. Yeah, so what, what I'm wondering is, while I understand there is greater density in terms of building volume, I was wondering where or is there greater density in terms of the number of occupants? Because if people can build a house to have 60 foot house or a 30 foot house, but not more people, then we actually don't have an incentive or a minimum to actually have a greater density of people in the community as opposed to building space. And maybe it's in there, but I was looking for that and I didn't see it. Right. Can I address that? Yes, please. Uh, you know, typically, uh, I'm Ken Bellov, I'm the chair of the Planning Commission. Typically, in a zoning set of zoning regulations, you wouldn't specify the number of people that would be uh, allowed in a dwelling unit. Density would cover the number of dwelling units that would be allowed within a zoning district. Um, as far as the number of people that could be allowed in any residence, there are state regulations pertaining to um, water and wastewater permitting, whether it's on an on-site system or whether it's through a municipal system. Um, and that's typically regulated by the number of bedrooms. Um, and they have formulas that govern those things. But you know, typically in a set of zoning regulations, you wouldn't regulate uh, necessarily how many people might be allowed in a dwelling unit. You would um, you would regulate the number of the maximum number of dwelling units that would be allowed. Billy, could I, could I add to that? Uh, I spent over 30 years in the, in the housing industry. And what you're really referring to is occupancy standards and occupancy standards control uh, how many people can live in a certain residence. Uh, you know, we have, you know, some municipalities have adopted a certain occupancy standards, others have chosen not to, based upon you know different federal regulations. Uh, there's really a lot that you know that if 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 a community doesn't have occupancy standards, uh, it's really hard to enforce how many people will go into a particular residence. So I think we're talking about apples and oranges when. We're talking about uh, the residential density and occupancy standards. Steve, at one point back when we were um, 
thinking about that housing project that was proposed for 51 South Main Street. Wasn't there discussion there about number of bedrooms and units or half units or something like that? Right. Yeah. So this right. is when we, we had a density that um, would limit that particular site to I think 15 units. And there was a, a bylaw amendment that would allow a one bedroom apartment to be considered as half a dwelling unit. So it basically allowed the density to be doubled uh, by going um, by going to one bedroom apartment. So I, I think that's the situation you're addressing, Bill. Uh, the, these bylaws are structured so that there wouldn't be a limit. So that the limit on numbers of dwelling units would really reflect the capacity of the site for uh, parking and no, that type of thing. Does okay. that answer your question, Bill? Yeah. Okay, good. Well, Mark, yeah. um, before this public meeting is over, if we could, I'd love to hear from the planning commissioners themselves as to, you know, this process, how they felt about it, whether they're happy with it. And uh, I, I wasn't here at the last meeting, so, uh, and I apologize for that, but. Um, I'd yeah, like to, let's get like to the public, yeah. the public feedback, and then we can move to that. Um, Dana, you had a question regarding ADUs. Uh, yeah, thanks, Mark. Um, so I understand that you know, obviously, accessory dwelling units are being used for short-term rentals. Um, you know, and that's an allowable use, Airbnb, and that sort of thing. Uh, what mechanisms, if any, do we have within these? not necessarily interim bylaws, but potentially for the next iteration to encourage long-term rental of ADUs because we have a housing crisis in the community. And if we start to see all of these ADUs go from long-term to short-term rental under an Airbnb or similar scheme, um, we're just gonna be exacerbating that problem. That's experience that I've had in other towns that I've lived in. Um, I'm not expecting the planning commission to have that answer within these interim bylaws. I think it's just something that I've seen happen elsewhere. And I think it would be germane to address that in this process for this, you know, for these new zoning bylaws. Um, so maybe you can answer the question and then just take it into consideration for the future. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in and, um, uh... If any of the planning commission members want to say something that that of course would be fine so short-term rental is a very complex issue uh various communities are are dealing with it right now we own property in greensboro a family farm and they're dealing with short-term rentals the state legislature is looking at short-term rental enabling statute that would um, impact this uh, personally i think we need to uh probably let the state um if they're going to pass legislation, it probably would be appropriate to have that happen first, and then uh, we could respond because there may be an enabling statute which will control how uh, Waterbury would address this issue. But uh, but I think it is a, it is an important one. We've had some conversation in the planning commission about this, uh, but it is a very complex issue that um, I think would have to deserve some time and a lot of public input uh, because of the um, owners who, who you know, have short-term rentals. So, you know, there, there's just uh, more discussion needed on that issue. That's my thought. I mean, Mark, you've had huge concerns about that in the past, right? Yeah, I mean, it, so for example, when I started doing business up there, you know, people lived and worked in town and the, increase in Airbnb business and, and other short-term rental models has really forced the workforce out of Stowe. Um, I think we're seeing it a little bit in Waterbury. I think the opportunity is, is that if we can figure out a path to development and control where that development exists, there's now an economy of, you know, instead of, you know, building another hotel, it's being, you know, this, this tourism market is being serviced by these short-term rentals. But if we don't have a way to backfill more units, we do have a vacancy problem. We have a vacancy problem in both single family and rental. So if we can't figure out a solution to that, affordability is going to go right out the window. Um, 
Dana, did that, did, did that answer your question? Uh, yeah, I guess in the, in the sort of short term, it sounds like we're playing a game of wait and see with the state to some degree. Um, but I guess <laughs> my, uh, my hope would be that in the face of that, we would be aggressive locally in figuring out some sort of solution either for incentivizing more multifamily res or creating some sort of alternative track for these ADUs to um, maybe for these owners to adopt long-term rental through some sort of tax incentive, property tax rebate, that sort of thing. Um, I think there's probably a lot of different ways to get at it. So I, uh, I appreciate it that it's complex. Yep, yeah, perfect. Thank you. Um, Danny had a question. Um, do you want to speak to it or I can read it? Um, either way, Mark, I'm just curious. I don't know that it's been addressed. Um, so I'm not sure where to find the information, but I'm curious if after the two years there are pieces within these bylaws that the town chooses not to adopt, are there repercussions or what happens to development that's already begun or been completed? Um, or does that, or is it just prohibiting any further development within those um, areas? Well, I, I can speak briefly to that. Maybe planning commission members uh, would want to speak to that. Um, you know, this is an issue with any bylaw that's developed. Um, and there are situations where bylaws change and uses may become a non-conforming use. They're allowed to continue. They're allowed to change under certain parameters. So that that is always a possibility with any bylaw that's that's enacted. Um, you know, this particular bylaw is we've been working on for uh, about three years. Um, they were developed by a consultant um, that uh, we hired with grant funding. And they, you know, there, there's been a lot of vetting, so um, I'm I'm not so concerned. But that that certainly is a risk in enacting any uh, zoning bylaw. You're correct. Yeah, like I said earlier, I'll put it in a simpler summary. Uh, too easy to give people something, and you pay hell taking it back. You know, so uh, like I said before, you got to be careful. Um, any other public comment? Mark, this is Mary Cohen. Yep, go ahead. I, um, as most of you know, just full disclosure, I am the vice chair of the planning commission, but I also live in the downtown district. So I'd like to speak as a, a part of the uh, broader public. And one of my um, concerns about the select board enacting these regulations without the full vetting and, and completed process that the planning commission goes through is that there will be a lot of um, of the, what has already been brought up, whether it be, um, you know, Chris's point about giving someone something and then taking it away or uh, Jason's point about fully thinking through the size of what's permitted, what's allowed um, how we um, really look at the definitions of in the use table. My main point though that I wanna make and because of the um, primary discussion and, and the push for enacting these as interim zoning comes from a business development point of view. I just wanna, and there've been comments about housing and I just wanna, echo those and reiterate that this uh, downtown district is um, intended to be, uh, currently is and should continue to be a um, mixed, it's not called a mixed use. It, as Steve said, it's a little more heavily developed in and more intense, but it's also intense housing. And we've got to be careful that whether, again, the size of businesses that are allowed, how that, what that impact is on housing. And I also, uh, one of the aspects that's not covered at all in these interim bylaws is the demolition of historic buildings. And this is, and this is part of the historic 
district in what what was formerly the Waterbury Village, um, the um, demolition of bu buildings has been an issue that we as you know, it's hard to kind of separate what I know about being on the planning commission, but we have uh, through our um, efforts to review and revise the historic building standards, historic preservation districts in, in, um, in Waterbury. One of the things that was, came through really clear is if uh, people understand that they, and, and don't want the historic buildings to be easily demolished. And that's something that isn't addressed at all in this um, interim bylaw. So I, I, it just, I, I hate to um, put out something that might be perceived as hyperbole, but to me, this, the um, need to address the issue of the current zoning and the restrictions and what Jason has said about um, interpretations over the years or currently or the um, narrowness by which some uses are defined that creates problems that there's rapid changes to what is um, you know a good business a good commercial option for people to develop it, it just seems to me that this is there are other ways that the select board could address the issue that has brought this to the forefront and I, I keep thinking of the phrase, it's like using a chainsaw to cut butter. It, it just seems the wrong approach. So as someone who lives in the district, um, I wanted to share that. So thank you. Steve, can you speak to the comment or maybe can you can now that these are interim zoning bylaws, does this somehow supersede any historical structure rules that we have or are those that would those still be in place by passing this? Can I just say they uh, they would still be in place, but they're not strong enough. We don't have any, um, I don't have them in front of me, but one of the things that we tried to address as a planning commission was that how easily an historic building can be demolished. There, there are no, um, I don't, Steve might be able to pull something up quickly, but um, that is a missing piece in our current zoning regulations. But, but that says, that's as is in the, in the current district even, right? I that's mean, correct, but I- This I, isn't I, making a situation worse. It's not correcting your issue, Mary, but it's, it's leaving right. it in the status quo. Correct, but and, it's it's an and, important it's an I I want to bring housing to the forefront, not just the commercial business aspect of the downtown district, and that's one of the missing pieces that we have in our current regulations. That's my no, I I understand, and you know, but I just want to make the point that it's the status quo, and as Steve said at the very beginning, if the planning commission wants to address that issue. Um, it doesn't have to take two years before these interim bylaws are replaced by something that's permanent. Um, you know, Mary suggested that there are other ways to, um, to solve this issue. And, and, you know, maybe it's a matter of philosophy. Um, we can't get into the, into the details, but, you know, the, the impetus of this was partly the, um, the denial by the DRB of the project that Jason wanted to do uh, at 23 Stowe Street, if that's the right, <clears throat> the right number. And uh, the owners of that property have, have um, reserved their right uh, to appeal to court that decision. Um, and again, without getting into all the details, and we've got to be careful about this, but the select board has the ability to, to, um, to settle lawsuits. And the select board in this one particular instance could deal with this particular issue just on that particular location. Uh, I talked with Steve at great length, and I thought I talked with the select board about the fact that you know, cutting the DRB out 
of conditional use of all the other things that this interim bylaw gives them the ability to, to have a say in uh, was a concern to me. I, I think that it's not a great idea just to uh, have the DRB disapprove a, an application and have as a matter of routine, the applicant decide to go to court and then the select board just gets to settle the lawsuit. Whether we think that's a good law or a bad law, it's the law. The, so, the select board can deal with these properties on an individual basis, one by one, anytime the DRB disapproves if the applicant um, then appeals to court. So it seemed to me that a better way to address the issue was to build on what the Planning Commission has already been doing to try to come up with some interim bylaws, which clearly the select board has the ability to put in place much more quickly than through the traditional process. So I'm not suggesting that this is my idea, but this is kind of how we got to this point because I think it's bad planning to allow the select board one property at a time to just say, well, you know, Joe Smith wants to do this. The, the bylaws don't allow it. He's appealed the, the denial and we're gonna cut a deal with it. I, I think that's bad. I, I think these interim bylaws are a better way to approach it. And, and the planning commission has the ability to come up with permanent bylaws as quickly as they're able to replace these. Um, so anyway, I, I understand the concern, but that's, I think, how we got to where we are tonight. Mark? Yep, good. So to your point, Bill, I, I guess I'd, I'd agree with you. I would hate to think that the select board could uh, uh, I guess show preference. I think you're asking for <laughs> huge liability issues if you get into that. So my con other concern is for the, for the planning commissioners that let's, I'll, I'll take a hypothetical situation, maybe similar to what we're dealing with. If somebody comes in town, a developer to do something, they go through a two year planning process uh, to build a building and rent it out in so many different ways. Um, from what I understand, and I could be completely wrong because I haven't got into the weeds of this whole process. If at the 11th hour, the developer decides that they want to put something in one section of the building that doesn't coincide with current regs, I think it's a little bit forward to expect the planning commissioners to, to jump through hoops to create interim laws to satisfy the specific need, whoever it may be, whatever it may be, uh, when there's you know so much detail involved in this process. Um, and they're expected to get it right. I mean, I can't ever believe that there will ever be a perfect set of zoning rights because of the way humans evolve, the way the businesses evolve, the way our lives evolve. You're never going to nail it right the first time. So to expect them to be perfect uh, and, and, you know, get it, get a uh, request like this kind of pushed upon them to make to make a, a snap results just seems unfair. Um, and I kind of inter am interested, that's why I'm interested in hearing from the planning commissioners as to if they felt like they were in put in that put in that circumstance. I'd be glad to comment when it's our turn. Yeah, um, we can we can um, close up or not close up, but at least uh, make sure everyone from the public has had an opportunity to speak um, for any feedback they have and then happy to go to the planning commission. And I think I can give you a little more information, Chris, on how we found ourselves here. 
But uh, is there anyone else from the public that would like to speak before we turn to the Planning Commission to have that discussion? So, you know, Chris, I, I hear you. And I, and I think what happened was, you know, I started to get involved in, in sitting in the DRB meetings, listening to the discussion on this specific project, but I've been involved in that economic development group for a while. And the big, the big problems that I feel like have existed are the density issues for any residential development just because of the cost and making a project viable. Um, I've heard about multiple businesses of different use have struggle to, um, to find location where they feel like they should be able to do business. Hair salons are the specific example I've used multiple times. Um, and then obviously this, this brewery, brew pub, bottling facility scenario. And basically the DRB turned to me as I was giving feedback in the DRB meeting of saying, you guys are supposed to be changing this. We're bound by these rules. It goes back to Jason's comment of why aren't you guys doing anything? So I asked, um, I don't know, a month and a half ago or two months ago of an update on where we were because I know we've been working on this a while. Ken suggested that we potentially break it apart in pieces um, because maybe it was more achievable. Um, and then a timeline was presented specific to the downtown as something that they felt was something that they could start to take on. Um, in terms of timing, I think, I don't feel like we put any additional pressure more than what it was basically like, we think we can present this in a certain time frame, And so Steve started working on that. So I think that's kind of the timeline and how the, the series of events unfolded. But uh, Ken, I'm happy to hand it off to you and hear your feedback and anyone else on the, the planning commission. And, you know, I don't want you to feel that we were trying to do anything more than spark discussion and try to move things forward. And, and I hate to hear any time that you know, potential opportunity for, you know, uh, business use or residential opportunity is being held back by us not moving forward. So, go ahead. Uh, okay, well, um, thank you. So, um, the Planning Commission did prepare a statement, which you all should have received um, at our last meeting on February the 8th. And we had a pretty lengthy discussion about whether or not we were gonna make a recommendation pertaining to these draft interim zoning regulations. Um, interim zoning is a tool that's available to the Planning Commission. It's your tool. It's not the Planning Commission's tool. Interim zoning, by definition, circumvents the Planning Commission process. Now, there have been examples um, I can think of two in the last year where the town has used interim zoning, but it actually came out of the planning commission. It wasn't required, but we, we made, we, we did some work and made some recommendations. I think it was the right thing to do at the time. Um, in this particular case, Mark, I think your description is, um, I'm going to try to be polite here, um, but a little bit self-serving. I, I don't think it went quite as uh, as smoothly as you've as you've described it to be. Um, the planning commission has been working on this stuff for a long time. It was not back in December or January that we decided to break it apart into pieces. That it was a decision that had already been made. I simply described something that we had already done. Um, you know, as you may recall, the Planning Commission's work has been impacted and interrupted by the quarantining restrictions, COVID-19. I mean, don't want to belabor that. Everybody knows we're all living in a compromised world right now. Um, but that certainly uh, interfered with our ability to do anything. Um, at the meeting with the select board that we were involved with, I don't recall, I think it may have been in December. Um, there had been sort of this, some discussion about interim zoning, but I did not come away from that meeting. And I don't think other members of the planning commission came away from that meeting, that that process was now gonna be uh, taken as the preferred course of action. So suffice it to say that we felt blindsided. Um, we felt slighted. 
and it really felt like a slap in the face to us. Um, we've been working hard trying to do a good job. And, you know, quite frankly, it's not always easy not only to reach a consensus amongst the five members of the board, but to try to come up with something that we think is going to work for you folks because you guys are a tough audience. We've had things in the past that we've brought to the select board after very lengthy discussions and public hearings with the planning commission and you know it's gone nowhere so it's it's a difficult process um it's difficult for us personally it's uh it's difficult to pull off logistically um the the urgency the perceived urgency of the matter um all of that information was was certainly not shared with the planning commission. Um, I, I received some information um, at some point, I wanna say it was in January from uh, Bill Sheplock that um, helped me understand things a little bit better, but um, it, you know, the damage had been done. And um, so, so yeah, you know, there's some hard feelings there. Um, it's not to say that we can't move on from there, but um, that's just the that's just a statement of fact. Um, I, to go uh, to go to Chris Chris's question, yeah, I don't know that it's a good idea to you know every time somebody gets denied an application for a permit, I don't know that that creates an emergency. Um, it's you know there are emergencies, and you know I. I, I if, if I were going to build a building and I was an applicant, I would do my homework ahead of time uh, and I would figure out what it is that I could do or couldn't do before I made the investment to go ahead and get a permit. That's what I would do. Um, and I, when, when I was working, the, you know, the way I would work with applicants is I would be very, very clear about how I saw things about how I saw the regulations and how I would handle with uh, with various, you know, permitting questions should they come up. So, um, you know, I, I don't work inside the town. I don't know how the town's process works. You know, my job situation was a little different. Um, I wore two different hats, but specifically to the planning commission, um, we did not make a recommendation, feelings aside. Um, as the statement says, we feel the document is unfinished. Um, the, you know, some of the issues that I know Jason Wolf has raised earlier about square footage and thresholds, whatever, we were having a lot of discussions about that. Um, and the, suffice it to say that stuff was unresolved. So, you know, that's kind of where we are. You know, a lot of the questions that I heard from people tonight deal with some of the very things that the, you know, the planning commission was trying to wrestle with, you know, and on the one hand, there are things like, yeah, wanting to be able to increase allowable densities because we're all in favor of there being more workforce housing in town. We're all in favor of there being a vibrant downtown district. Um, we're, we're, we're all in favor of that. The other side of that, you know, Mary has given voice to another issue, which is that there also there are people who live in the village and they have their own special concerns and all those things have to be balanced. Um, but a lot of that stuff we hadn't resolved. Um, there had been a lot of back and forth. Not everybody on the planning commission thinks about things in one mind, probably the same as you folks do. You know, I doubt all of you have all the same points of view on all of the issues. There's some back and forth. Um, there may be disagreements. There may be sl split votes. Um, so we try to work as a group to develop a consensus. It's not always easy to do that. That's the goal to do that. Um, and sometimes that takes time. So um, that's, you know, in a nutshell, that's, you know, our, our view from our little corner of the world and a little more background as to why we um, 
made the statement that we did pertaining to interim zoning. You know, at the end of the day, you guys are in charge. Interim zoning, it's your, it's your baby. If you want to pass it, you know, there's nothing we can do about it. Um, whether it's the right thing to do or not, I, you know, I, I don't know. That's up to you guys to decide. But specifically in terms of what that impact has been on the Planning Commission, um, I've tried to give you a summary there. Yeah, I mean, obviously, I'll, I'll follow that up. I, I didn't see that feedback, so I, I apologize that um, you felt blindsided. I, you know, I started working with Steve to talk about timelines, but at no point did I, I heard rumblings of a potential issue with the Planning Commission. I apologize that I didn't follow up directly, um, but if I would have gotten feedback from Steve <coughs> hearing that there were issues um, and, and major concerns with anything, including timeline, I would have, I would have gone to you. So I, I apologize for that. I, you know, in terms of self-serving, the only consideration there is that I've just been involved in watching projects go to a certain point and then not come to fruition. And I watched, you know, Jason and his group struggle, you know, in the idea of self-serving, the same brewery got permitted to go in my building. They found another building during my permit process and decided they want to pursue that and it's around the corner and the question mark of why is it permitted here and why is it not permitted there so you know I I hear you and I hear your concerns nothing that I see in the interim zoning concerns me as much as the potential of losing out who knows when we'll get to a full you know zoning rewrite but I think there's there's precious time passing and to Mary's concern I do think density is a big reason on why developers aren't address or aren't building in our downtown or anywhere near our downtown. I just don't think it's financially viable with the current rule book. So I think that's what I've learned over the years, um, being on that economic development group through RW is that that's what's holding them back in a lot of ways. And I would hope that, you know, just the air right and opportunity and height requirement of 60 feet could potentially turn on that kind of development and help us with our vacancy problem. But I'd be interested in hearing from Steve or Bill on this. Uh, Katie's been wanting to say something, Mark. You might want to. Yep, go ahead, Katie. Uh, first of all, Ken, I told you to tell it how it was and to be, you know, pretty hard on. So Mike and myself attended one of the last planning commission meetings and it's not so cookie cutter as that they were really ticked off. They were very upset. They felt like they had two meetings to pull things together. They had to push off different projects just to focus on this task right now. So they did not feel confident in us and there was a lot of miscommunication. So I felt like we did a disservice to them by forcing them to look at this right now, even though this has been in the works for a couple of years, but I just felt like they had been slighted. And um, if they don't feel like this is unfinished and that it could be clarified more, I think we should listen to them. That's not me saying or discouraging other businesses should not look to come to town because I want businesses to come to town and stay here for a long time. But I think that these all these details need to be picked with a fine tooth comb so they can't be you know, misinterpreted or questioned later on. I think that it's important that we get everything straight one time through, if we can, for everybody to be on the same level and understand everything clearly. Mike, did you want to follow up since you were at that meeting as well? Yeah. You're muted, Mike. Mike, you're still muted. The, joy, the joys of Zoom. Um, sorry about that. Uh, I was at the February 8th meeting as well. And although I came to that meeting mostly as an individual, I provided some comments to the Planning Commission. And I know I had a kind of tough, I'll be very honest, you know, it was a very tough uh, response from the Planning Commission. I came looking for some sort of collaborative process for us to go forward. Maybe it's not the totally right time, but also 
I, I also, knowing from being a manager, you don't want to delay things forever. But I hear what the planning commission is saying. You know, this is not perfect, but I hear also where Mark and some of the other people have commented that we do want some things that could help move our community together and advance some development of all sorts. I think that's really important. But I do think it's really important that the select board and the planning commission work together. I tried to say that at that meeting and I don't think I, I got through it all. You know, I do believe that all of the boards and commissions in this co community need to work together, not as isolated entities. And if, if I slighted them in any way, I did not mean to, and I, I don't think I did. You know, also I do think we need to move some things forward and maybe we're not at the point that we, you know, as Ken says, to do something right now, maybe we, it needs a little bit of tweaking, but I do want to hear from the planning commission and I do want feedback because I think they're the experts. You know, I, uh, you know, I was under the, under, under the impression that this was a collaborative process between the town planner and the planning commission. More than I found out that it was the, the process for the interim bylaws was mainly put together by Steve. So I don't know where we, we want to be with this. I'm kind of a little bit confused. I do want consensus and I do want to have a collaborative plan, not a, you know, a top-down push, push uh, thing because of some special interest. That's my two cents. <laughs> Right. Well, I, I just want to make sure nobody ends up blaming Steve here. Um, the select board directed staff that they wanted to, to, um, to implement interim zoning to deal with this issue. Steve's the planner, so I directed him to, uh, to, to write these interim bylaws, and, and I directed him to share this with the planning commission and whether the planning commission wanted to see that this was going in this direction or not, they clearly knew uh, at least through staff and me from Steve and me that we had been asked by the select board to, to do this. And Steve, I'm sure I did not attend any planning commission meetings, but I'm sure these bylaws were shared with the planning commission and whether the planning commission felt it was collaborative process or that this was just what it was gonna be. I, I think Steve tried to get their input. So um, we are where we are. Uh, we, have, uh, we have a situation where we have an applicant who's been denied by the DRB. That applicant has appealed to court. Uh, we're gonna have to, um, we're gonna have to answer that appeal uh, whether that means defend our permit or defend the DRB's decision, or if the select board decides that it wants to, uh, to settle the, the issue by somehow uh, making some other arrangements in, in issuing a permit. But uh, I, I'm understanding of how, how the different individuals and the different boards feel. But from my perspective, it was put pretty clear from the discussions that we had, the one that Ken was at in December, and then in January, there was a, an agenda item on the, on the uh, select board's agenda and the select board directed staff to, to draft interim zoning bylaws and to try to get it um, to the board by the end of January. Now, here we are, uh, it's, close to the end of February and we're having the, the hearing on it. But that's, the, that's what the process is. And I, I don't believe this was staff driven, that this was me and Steve just saying, oh, we're gonna develop interim bylaws uh, and everybody else be damned. That's, that's not how it played out. So it's, as Ken says, it's in the select board's hands right now. You have the ability to do a couple of things. You can approve these as they've been presented tonight. Uh, you can disapprove them and decide not to implement them. You can ask for some changes to be made. 
uh, or you can ask staff to go back and make some changes that are more than um, you know edits. I, th I think you can make basically any change that you want right now. Um, Steve, correct me if I'm wrong, but even if it's a substan substantive change, the select board could make that change tonight and still adopt it if they wanted to. I'm not suggesting that, but that's possible, right? That, that's correct. I checked with um, our municipal attorney and he said that that is the way interim bylaws are set up. You can make substantive changes. You can adopt them tonight. You can adopt them at a, a subsequent meeting. That, that is correct. Okay. Yeah. And um, yeah, I, I mean, I think Bill is, is absolutely accurate. And, um, you know, I know this has been hard for the planning commission. It's been hard for all of us, but I, um, you know, this draft is based on the planning commission work. Um, I did not make any, I think I made one change to the planning commission draft at that time. And I understand that the planning commission feels that this is unfinished. I understand that. I think there is a process where we can move forward uh, in uh, working on some permanent bylaws where we can, um, we, we can refine this and we can get more public input, but, um, I personally don't see any reason not to move forward. I think, um, you know, a lot of thought has gone into this. I had two meetings with the planning commission to go over um, my draft, which was based on their work. So, um, and I understand the whole concern about, um, about this being unfinished. I have some recommendations for some changes that the select board does choose to move forward tonight. They're not major changes. They're changes I've already discussed with you as a matter of fact. So, um, but I think Bill directed this process and um, from a staff perspective, and I want to make sure everybody, including the planning commission, un understands that. I was not given a choice about preparing this draft. So I was directed and here, and here we are. So, um, but at any rate, that, that's enough on my stump, but uh, that's my thoughts. For uh, Chris, before you go, I think Martha wanted to talk and then. Yeah, go ahead, Martha. Yeah, um, uh, this is all good dialogue and it is good for the boards to have a, an exchange. And, uh, and I also want to thank Katie and Mike for coming to our last meeting. Um, you know, I just want to give a little bit, I, I'll just take a couple more minutes <laughs> to, to give it a little perspective. If you were to take the current bylaw document and just put it on the table, and take what we're trying to implement now and flip a couple of pages, you'll go, oh my God, what a different document. And from my perspective, and I spend a lot of time in permitting worlds, the, just the body of the documents themselves is, is a huge challenge to make sure that what was in the original uh, is either addressed is improved, uh, is changed, and then be able to move forward and it is in the benefit of the town. So they're, so just physically the documents. And, and I bring this up because it has made this process additionally challenging, I think. That's my personal opinion. Then we meet twice a month, twice a month. So if we have a, a, a request of Steve for, uh, which I'm going to talk to specifically, what are the current situations? What is the current uh, predominant square footage for a restaurant? What's the current uh, retail space that's, that's already been permitted? And what are the uses along Main Street? And give us, a, give us information so that we can then look at what the consultant proposed as new dimensions. And are they one consistent with what we have, and two, improved better or what we want going forward. So there's each one of those things is like eat. And then she also, to Jason's point, which I think is absolutely spot on, the number of uses, the use table itself was probably double the descriptive uses of what we have now. And becomes more restrictive in terms of, you know, is it, um, is it a salon with a, with an extra sink or not? I mean, I just don't, I, you know, it's just so nitpicky. It was ridiculous. And so we spent a whole series of time 
just scaling back all the uses, saying, no, nope, we want them broader. They need to be more flexible. They need to be able to allow for growth and flexibility in businesses that we don't even know are coming. So there was all of that process. Um, but then remember, we only meet twice a month. <laughs> now throw in COVID, throw in the request for an interim historic or a, a historic district improvement bylaw. Oh, we got to put the regulations aside and now we have to deal with this. We get another request for a signed bylaw. Oh, we got to put the regulations aside and, and deal with this interim issue. So and I am defending us a little bit, but I think you need to, I hope you appreciate that we're trying to do the best job we can for the benefit, economic, the benefit of the town. Um, my personal uh, gripe, if you will, it's not a gripe, but my personal view on this last month, I really do feel we were told, and I went back and looked at the minutes from the January 4th select board meeting, and it says that um, direct staff to prepare interim bylaws as expeditiously as possible. That doesn't say by February 1st, that says as expeditiously as possible, and we took that in all sincerity and dug right in at our very next meeting as we have been. So then we were told that it had to be done by February 1st, which only gives us two meetings. So you got, so we felt like we were sort of stripped with any, any ability to finish anything. Um, the, the, where I started to go here was the reason it bothers me that we're addressing just the downtown issue is we've had people, uh, property owners along the Route 100 district who are trying to sell their property. So you don't think they've taken a personal economic hit because they can't sell their property because it's not zoned for what really wants to go there, a commercial activity. So and those people have been waiting and waiting and they've come back and we've said, oh, you gotta wait, we gotta finish the bylaws. Now we have this other issue come up and it's wham, bam, have an interim bylaw by the end of the month. So it's just a little hard to take in uh, understanding that there's the folks out on Route 100 that are waiting to be considered. Um, and then the last thing is I, I just really go back to the fact that we've asked for, and Steve does the best he can, but we only meet every two weeks. <laughs> so we asked for these dimensional tables. You know, when you look at the threshold of 2,000 or 5,000, to me, that's almost the biggest issue because if you don't get those numbers right, to Chris's point and Jason's point, you set up this interim bylaw for a couple of years, and then we go out and we find real information as to what is a reasonable value. And now we've either, now either these projects are too big or they've been harmed by being too small. And, and I just don't think that's fair to the developers either. So we're trying to come up with the right uses, right use descriptions, and then the right dimensional table, whether it's to trigger, whether it's per permitted or conditional. And, um, and then lastly, I just want to go back to the mapping question that Mark raised earlier. Um, we took on the uses and the dimensional tables to get those right. And in my mind anyway, I don't feel that the, the boundaries of the districts were all set in stone and done. Because I think that if you get the uses and the dimensional tables correct, then you can see how big of an area you want to apply that, those, those conditions to. So uh, to your point on the north end of Main Street, I agree, Mark. Um, I don't see why we're cutting that out, honestly. Uh, but I think it, in my mind, it's because we never resolved the use, the use in dimensional tables. So thank you. Yeah, so uh, I mean, I'll, reiterate that I think it's a little bit of just miscommunication between the boards and, and I want to apologize on behalf of the select board. I think there was a feeling at a meeting that here we have another issue in downtown. Can we do anything? I think we need to split up the, the plan. We could do it through interim. Okay. And, and I don't think I ever thought that we were going to be 
presenting anything to the select board that was much farther off the, than the work that you've already done on, on your board. So I think that's where, um, you know, talking about timing, I think it was just more, when can this be done? What, you know, what's the quickest it could be done, but not at a, at a rate that I, like I personally was trying to support any faster than the board wanted to support the, the planning commission and, and what work that they've already done. To me, this is, this is a little bit of, of surprise to me to hear these concerns and I apologize that I, I wasn't um, aware of this. So, you know, to me, I guess my question is, is okay, if, if we're, if the planning commission feels this way now, what would you like to see happen? And if we slowed it down, like, you know, some of this, I'm wondering why, you know, we've had been working on this plan for a while. So, you know, these questions on sizing and what's the right sizing 2000, 5,000, how come some of that hasn't been answered yet, I guess today. And, you know, I, I'm a little surprised. There's not a lot of public comment in here today saying that these regulations are too out, outside of what the expectation would be. I would think if they were, we'd see a lot more public comment. So I guess my question to the, the select board is, is are we that far off on where we would need to be if we do decide to consider an interim zone? Go ahead, Chris. So uh, first I wanna to convey to Jason Wolf, I'm a businessman, I've been for over 40 years. Get it. I understand what business is all about. Time is money. I know all about it. But fortunately or unfortunately, we operate by a legislative process. We have certain officials that are elected to certain positions, and we have volunteers that take on other positions that uh, we rely on. We rely on their expertise, we rely on their decision-making, we rely on their uh, input through this process. And otherwise we have to deal with all of that and we just don't have the capabilities of doing that. We currently have a great planning commission and a great planner. Uh, I feel like they feel like they've been slighted to some degree or in some cases have had dirt kicked in their face. Um, it's getting harder and harder to be a, an, a, an official or elected official or a community involved member, especially in the last year or so. It's getting more and more difficult where the public is less tolerant of elected officials and their decision making. Um, and quite honestly, in the town of Waterbury, when we have people that litigate against the municipality for whatever reason, I, I myself feel slighted. Um, and I hope and beg and pray that the current board members on the planning commission don't decide with all the stress that you've had to endure to walk, because that means we'd have to replace you. And uh, the impact of that would be quite detrimental, I think, to the town. Um, so my heart goes out to you. Uh, I know what it's like to endure difficult times. Um, so I'm going to ask the same thing that Mark just asked. Uh, what would you think would be enough additional time? Because uh, I think just jumping back, my stance has been right along. You know, you shouldn't have to be made to be whipped to make decisions to 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 move a situation forward whoever it might be um so i'm going to ask what additional time would you be comfortable with uh, and be honest about it and because right now i i don't have any uh expectation that i would vote to move these interim regs for forward tonight uh because i don't feel that uh, you guys have had ample time uh to do what you need to be to do to, to satisfy um, yourselves and the town's needs. So is that question going to us or? Sure, sure. Well, what, what I would say, uh, Chris, 
uh, my first response would be um, how much time would it take is going to depend partly on what it is that you want us to get done. Um, if, if we had a clear sense about there were, may, maybe there's a specific agenda, a specific item, maybe there's a couple of them. Maybe it's not the whole downtown zoning district, that that's a priority, that somehow there's, a, there's an issue that you're trying to get some resolution to. That would help us. Um, because I think as, as everybody should have seen, just looking at the text, there's a lot of stuff in there. You've got a whole gamut of uses that, you know, they're all, you know it covers a really, really broad range um, because it's a mixed use district. That's the nature of our village. We have all kinds of stuff there. It's not like we're talking about some sort of monolithic, you know, residential, you know, subdivision. Um, you got a mix of stuff that's there already. It's it's developed over time. We don't necessarily want to put anybody out of business. We don't necessarily want to make anybody non-conforming. That's a risk that can happen when you start to change zoning regulations. I think we've already talked about other unintended consequences if you craft regulations that are too broad and too permissive. So I think for me personally, um, to answer the question of how much time would depend on what it is that you want us to get done. Back in December, I gave you a sort of a ballpark answer that I thought, you know, maybe by June. Well, you know, it's 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 hard it's hard to put a a clock on how long it's going to take to develop consensus. Um, you know, you might as well ask how long is the current United States Congress going to develop a consensus on virtually anything? Well, it might never happen. Um, I, I feel a little bit more optimistic with the Planning Commission than with the Congress, but um, nonetheless, it's a five-member board, and you know, we have to work together. Um, I think for us to accomplish anything that could be thought of as dealing with this entire zoning district, you're talking about, you know, several months. Um, but there are the, the issues where we have spent the most amount of time recently, um, I think go to the heart of um, what I think the select board is trying to achieve, which is some of these economic development um, issues, questions, problems um, here in the, you know, in the district. So um, it's, it's probably not as pointed an answer as you were hoping for, but that's the best I can do. Maybe I'll ask Jason if he doesn't mind uh, how time sensitive is your request in is there is there any flexibility on your end the, 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 the honest answer is it, it, it goes to uh the ryan who's, who's on would know the answer to that i, I do want to step back because i think it's been misinterpreted what we're doing i i think for probably most of the people who have read the the, the zoning regulations and then interpreted the, the use that we're proposing, which is a brew pub, which is down the street, the layman would assume that that is an allowed use in this, in this uh, setting. Um, and so the, the, the perception that we are suing the town or we think there's, we're, we're trying to skirt the rules or something, no, we're, we're simply trying to clarify that. And so I think why this is so important is the, what, the fact that these regulations were made in 1996 is that it's very difficult to understand what you can and cannot do. It's, it's not that we are trying to do something that we think was not allowed. It, it's that from our reading of it, it's a bar, no different than what Prohibition Pig is. And, and, and that's unclear. And, and, and so I, I think it does need to happen um, sooner rather than later. And then waiting, you know, we, we had this issue two years ago as well. Um, so in terms of whether this particular use will still be available six months from now, they might, um, 
I, I couldn't tell you, we don't have a signed lease. Um, you know, and, and the point about the, the urgency and that something has changed. We did, we had a tenant for two floors for, for of office space. Because of COVID, that's no longer happening, right? Because they're now working from home. So uh, the, the idea that there's not urgency and there isn't some change, I think is a little bit um, um, mis misguided there. Um, and, and I really do appreciate all the work and effort that everybody's putting in into this. I don't want it to be about me. I, I think it's, it's more important that, that these rules are very vague and anything we can do to clarify, not only my circumstance, but, but many others that are looking at Waterbury because it is currently um, you know, going through a lot of change right now. So maybe I can ask a question that could shed some light, maybe not. Um, back when the alchemists started down where the pig is now, Steve. They started their brewery downstairs, correct? I mean, I was there after the flood and the reconstruction process started. I recall the discussion about what was going to happen with that building and the fact that they were going to start a brewery downstairs and then the restaurant was upstairs. Isn't that similar to what Jason's request is? if I'm understanding his request correctly? Well, Chris, I'm gonna give you a short answer and then I'd like to make a recommendation, see if Bill's, Bill agrees here. Uh, the Alchemists did have a brewery in the basement that was flooded with tropical storm Irene. It was um, you know, associated with a restaurant. Um, then there, the, the new restaurant Prohibition Pig got a brewery approved as an accessory use to the restaurant. It was, I think about 120 seat restaurant. So. That, that's how that was approved as an accessory use. Um, I think the select board, and Bill, I'd like you to jump on this. You know, we're getting into the legal issues. We've got an appeal that the town is party to. The select board may want to consider an executive session to talk about how to move forward. And Bill, I, I guess I'd like you to jump in. I'm very concerned about us talking about a situation that's under appeal. So I guess I'd ask Bill before we get into more back and forth, I really think we need to be careful how we move forward. And I think the select board may want to have a discussion among themselves to figure it out. But Bill, I, I guess I'd ask you to jump in here before we get too much further. Well, if you're going to talk about the specific denial in the appeal, then yes, I'm not sure that's really what Chris was asking. Um, I think that the the um, the zoning administrator in the in the DRB believed that what was proposed by uh, Jason and his partner was different than what was proposed at the at the pro pig, um, uh, and I think that's to, to Jason's point. It from their perspective, it it doesn't seem all that different than what was approved down at the pro pig. Uh, <laughs> Dina looked at it a certain way. Uh, we got legal advice and the DRB looked at it a certain way, given how the regulations are written and, and determined that, no, it, it's not permissible. permissible. So uh, if we're gonna talk about the specific issue of Jason's property and the appeal, yeah, we should go into executive session. I'm not sure that's gonna be fruitful right now because um, I don't have any recommendation we can, we can, uh, you know, uh, expand a little bit on, on this discussion that I'm having right now, but I, I don't think an executive session is going to help us at the moment, because this is not about just Jason's situation. This is about the zoning district. And, uh, you know, I, I appreciate Ken's comments before. Um, he, 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 I don't know if you're hedging on even June now, Ken. It seemed like you said June a couple months ago, and I know we're a couple months closer to June now, but it just seems that this bylaw, uh, whether we're talking about doing it one district at a time or we're doing it all at once, just kind of goes on forever. And I'm not sure that we can wait forever. Uh, Congress left aside. I, I'm no happier about Congress not being able to get anything done. But you know, how long have how how long has the planning commission been working on getting something 
done for these bylaws. And um, whether one district at a time or the whole thing all at once is the way to do it, I don't know, but we don't seem a whole lot closer to the end than we were a year ago. And I know we've had COVID, but we can meet. We're meeting right now. You can meet twice a month um, and not be sitting at the same table and still get something done. So Bill, I would like to just say that I wasn't hedging my bets. Um, okay. my, my, my hope was that it would have been shorter than June, not longer than June. Okay, so. good. Glad to hear that. And I apologize. I was just trying to narrow the gap between the problem that we're faced with and the time frame to cure it. Um, but I think, you know, Ken, Ken did ask a question that hasn't been answered yet. And, you know, what is the select board asking for? So if the select board wants to ask the planning commission, look, we understand Route 100 is an issue. We understand other things are an issue. Let's get the downtown done. If that's what the select board wants, and we're not going to adopt these interim bylaws tonight, I, I would suggest at least you tell the planning commission what you'd like. If, if Route 100 is more important than the downtown, tell them that. But I think we've got to get something done for the people like Jason out there who are just waiting. Well, I think with the consideration of the reconstruction of Main Street, the new business that have come into town, um, Route 100 is <laughs> and has been kind of just floating out there forever. Uh, the fact that, you know, I don't know if the wastewater system is any further moving forward towards ending up that way or whatever, but it just seems like um, the urgency seems to be in the, in the downtown. Yeah, well, there's no wastewater going up Route 100 anytime soon, <laughs> that's for sure. I guess that was my point. <laughs> well, and I think part of it too goes back to our meeting where Ken came and, and we discussed splitting it apart. It seemed like downtown was a potential opportunity to take on an interim basis. I think I was a little confused to understanding the process and how exactly it would play out. So I, I apologize. I don't think I was ever doing anything that I thought was at a rate that that was but you know feeling you guys making you slide it so I, again i apologize for that i think hearing i've definitely heard the concerns on 100 too but i know that 100 development and conversations surrounding that have been a more dev divisive scenario than you know i think what we're talking about doing in the downtown um so you know me personally in terms of of where to focus i i after this conversation want to take a breath, have a conversation with Bill, Steve, and Ken about timing. I, I do I do have concerns that this doesn't look like maybe what you were going to present down the road from an overall plan. I thought we were kind of taking what you had done and the work you've done in the last couple of years, and it was very similar on the direction and decisions you've already made for the downtown. So to me, it was putting forward something that there wasn't as much conversation being had and the, the difficulties you might have been having about presenting a, a plan to us was more issues you were dealing with about sprawl or whatever else in the in the other zoning areas so I understood that completely and don't, don't want to force that hand but if from what I thought the feedback we were getting was that the downtown there wasn't a lot to decide on and potentially could be moved forward and I remember you saying, you know, the timing in which you thought, and then Steve had presented a different timing. And I, you know, to me, that sounded great. You know, I thought, oh, we, we can maybe move faster than what we originally discussed in the select board meeting. I didn't realize how it was playing out. So again, I, you know, I'm trying to wrap my head around that right now as we talk, but I, I do have concern that time is passing. I understand if it, if it's months, I, I'd support months of continuing to work on this. I'm not going to support years of working on this. Mark, what can we do to uh, lighten the load on these guys with these other issues, or can we? I mean, to give them give them some breathing room to maybe focus more on one particular issue. Do we have that capability, Steve? Mark? I, I, I would look to, I would look to Ken to help us understand that. 
well, so here's what I would say. If so, what I'm hearing is there's there's a press on there's a particular use which I'm not going to focus on the particular use. I'm going to put it in a class of uses, which really has to do with um, sort of the economic vibrancy of the downtown. If that's the, the primary concern, now, now these are my words, so you can tell me whether these words are words that you use, would use. But if that's what you think is the most important, then we can focus on that. I think, in fact, that's what we had been doing the last couple of meetings. And as I said earlier, you know, this the these threshold questions of, you know, whether when something is considered to be, you know, a use that's uh, considered to be a use allowed by right, a permitted use versus a conditional use, we were having some good discussions about that. Um, you know, there was some back and forth between members of the planning commission, some back and forth between planning commission and staff. Some of what we were talking about represented points of departure from how the town has done things in the past. Um, and some of that had to be resolved, but uh, I think we were making some progress on that score. Um, you know, some of the issues that were raised here tonight, residential densities, whatever, whether or not the zoning district should be bigger. And those, th those were not the things that we have been focusing on. Um, so, but if again, if that's if if that's what you'd really like to see us get done in the short term, I think that would help us. What's always I shouldn't say always, but what frequently has been um, a concern for the planning commission as we're doing our work is um, how is it going to be received when it comes to you folks? So if we you know if you can kind of give us an idea where you want us to go, that's gonna help us. It's not to say that, you know, we're just gonna, you know, roll over like a bunch of bowling pins and not give you our two cents, but it still would help. Um, you know, we had a situation where there was a there was an action item in the town plan from a couple of years ago to take up historic uh, preservation regulations. And we did a lot of work on this and we got we ran into a buzzsaw of a public hearing and you know mark at that hearing you stood up in the back and you said well wasn't that wasn't the select board that said to do this that was just one person from the select board well you know we kind of felt like we were thrown under the bus because here we were somebody you know we went to a public hearing with the select board and we were told we should take a look at this after the town plan was done. And we did, we thought we were doing our job. And then, you know, so there wasn't a constituency for it out in the public. You know, I get that, you know, that comes with the territory, but we felt really unsupported. And, you know, when you have a situation like that, and there've been some other cases where um, we've done some work on things and it's been a tough sell with the select board. Um, it, it, it impedes our ability to get things done when we're, when we're having to second guess. So I say that in uh, the true spirit of cooperation, like help us out here, give us some direction, tell us where you want us to go and then we can focus. And then we can come back to you with something, you know, in a in an expeditious um, manner. Um, now, I also think that just speaking for myself, I think that that the planning commission has needed a little bit of prodding. Um, it, it, I don't think it's all totally our fault. We we tried to do some things. There was an effort in the proposed zoning bylaw to do some down zoning. Um, up in the Waterbury Center area, which down zoning is very difficult, even under the best of circumstances. And we lost a lot of time um, essentially fighting with people who, you know, who, who just wanted no part of it. We abandoned that course of action and, and started to focus on the village because it did seem to us like, number one, that was a bigger priority. And also it presented us with the greatest opportunity to actually get something done. Um, I personally would like us to get something done. Um, I personally would like us to get 
something to you folks um, that that there can be a consensus and agreement on. Um, so help us out. Mike, I think you have a comment. Were you trying to jump in? Yes, I, yes, I did. I think uh, Mary had her hand up too, but... <laughs> You know, people kind of jump, jump around. I think, you know, we need some, you know, rules of order, but a couple of very brief comments based upon what was said. One, I don't think we should approve or, or deny these interim bylaws for one applicant. You know, I think that's, that's a real mistake. If we ever have to respond to a specific applicant case, it's not the function of doing in, interim bylaws. So that's that's a comment. I do think that again, in the spirit of cooperation, yes, I think we do maybe need to move to maybe look at some of these things. Yes, we don't want to take forever, you know, because there is some importance associated with these things to see the economic vitality of our community. So we do want to move forward, but that's where I want to work together with the planning commission on trying to get something that makes sense. And maybe, you know, what I'm going to do is make a, make a motion at this point to table the interim bylaw uh, vote. I don't know if we can do that versus turn it down at, at this time. I'm not saying we don't want interim by, bylaws, but I think it needs some re, reworking as Bill would had said in his dialogue. That's all I have to say, thanks. I think somebody should, so Mike, you, you can't do anything until you close the hearing, but um, you know, maybe somebody's gonna have to step up and throw it at a throw out a date if we're not gonna do it tonight. So it's it's January, uh, February 22nd. Can these be ready for May 1st? I would not agree. Just, can, just asking, can we just... wanna hear from you and say <laughs> when you feel you can get this done? I that's, that's where I came to the planning commission. I wasn't throwing stones. I just wanna to work together and get, get things done, you know, and help you know, applicants so they could do things in, in our community. Right, but that's know. why I just said May 1st because we've heard from almost everybody and we're all just going around the bush. Exactly. So let's pick a date and I'm gonna ask you, can it be done by May 1st? Well, I'll, I'll tell you this, Bill. I will do everything in my power to get the Planning Commission to get something to you by May 1st. And, and, and if we can't get it done, I'll quit. Well, how many meetings? How many meetings? How many meetings between now and May first? That's Five. I guess that's my question. Five. Yeah. Is that three, ample enough? We've already made. Yeah, the planning commission's already made a decision to have three meetings in March. So we're going. We're our, we've scheduled an additional meeting beyond what we would already have had, and then if we only had our regularly scheduled meetings in April, that would be two more. So that would be a total of five meetings. But again, I'm gonna ask my question one more time. Uh, I'm asking the select board to give us some guidance, help us to focus our attention. Well, I think, I think you, at least if this represents the work that you've already done, I think economic vitality, increased density, which seems to already be addressed. I think those are the big ones that I feel have been holding back some projects in downtown. I want to reiterate that I didn't approach this as I thought it might help one project, but I was hoping overall to help the economic vitality of downtown by doing what the work that that you were doing and, and Steve was doing. And so I, you know, take the time you need to do it the way that you feel like it need should be fit. Of course, I always get concerned of too much regulation, but I think there needs to be a solid rule book with very clear definitions on uses. I think that's where this one and hearing the pain and struggle of an applicant and never not even getting to the DRB. They didn't even get off of Dina's desk 
that got denied on the desk and they were working with Dina on the application. Like to me, that is a disservice of Waterbury to people trying to do business in our town. So we need to fix it. And, and I'm not going to try to pressure anyone into voting on these interim tonight, but I do want to say that these are real, real people trying to do business in our town who are spending money. And I want to see that not only this project, hopefully figure out a solution to, but there's, you know, there's, there's other people that I think would hope to do business and hopefully create some housing in, in our downtown. Mark, can I just ask something for the select board? Um, yep. You know, staff took your direction, Bill gave me direction. We presented a draft to you. I think it would be really helpful for me and the planning commission for you to tell us if this draft is going in the direction that you want the planning commission to go. They've asked you for direction. We, I've tried to, my best to put this together with the planning commission's input so far and present it to you. So I think it'd be really great if, and it, I'm not asking for a vote or anything, and you don't have to take a vote tonight. You can just not act on these interim bylaws, but Bill may have a different idea. But I think it would be really helpful, and I, and I don't know if you can do that tonight or maybe even by their next meeting is uh, March 1st, next Monday, for the planning commission and me to know if this draft is in the right direction or not because um, otherwise I don't, I don't it's, it's hard to know where to take this to be honest with you mark if we can uh, postpone it for a week I mean I didn't get a chance to really read through them the way I'd like to read through them um, so if we could have a little time for that I'd appreciate it and and I think the feedback and and I hear you can on you know, the, maybe the disconnection between the boards and even myself personally, I think that I and the board could do a better job of trying to do some planning and helping set direction. I think sometimes we forget what our role exactly is. And, um, you know, it, unfortunately I think timing and, um, you know, I think we've always talked about trying to be better at attending planning commission meetings. And I know I personally have not done a good job of that. Um, and I think that there needs to be more discussion surrounding direction planning. So you have a clear, clear role there. And I think we're all learning too. I mean, even being on the board five years, I learned a lot tonight. So again, uh, I think Martha wanted to say something that Katie yeah. I saw. And then I think we do have to put an end to tonight and then we can move forward and figure out how to follow up. Yeah, thanks, Mark. I just want to add, um, hearing from the select to me the biggest question on the downtown regs are the scale what is the select board's goal for the scale of development in in the downtown and that's why i was bringing up the dimensional tables because this is just me sitting on the planning commission i know how much area i need if i'm going to do solar or any renewables but i don't know how much area you need for a restaurant or a salon or light in industry and and getting a sense from the select board of what is the scale of the future of Waterbury's downtown would be really helpful from from my perspective. Thanks Martha. Um, Katie, I think you wanted to say something. I was just going to say um, I agree with what you said earlier Mark and I think that that May deadline would be good and I'm definitely planning on attending more meetings and if everybody else in the planning commission mainly uh Martha and Mary are good with it I don't want to take you guys off again so if that date sounds good with you guys I that's good with me so well, I would just if I could just make one last comment and then I'm I won't say anything else unless I'm forced to um uh you know, talking about things that, that don't sit right with you can be uncomfortable. Nobody likes to do it. Um, that said, um, I appreciate the Planning Commission hearing us out at the level of detail that you've heard us out. Um, it does go a long way. Um, and I know I made this comment to both Michael and to, to you know, Katie, they were came to our last meeting. Um, you know, we, we want to feel like we're all on the same team. Um, you know, it's not, you know, it, it, we're not, 
you know, like in some sporting event where there's one teams on one side of the field and one's on the other, and we're going to try to annihilate each other. We, we want to be on the same team. Um, we want to work together. I think all of us on the planning commission, you know, we volunteer our time because we want to make a positive contribution to the town. We want to do something that helps the town invest in its future. Um, I, I like to think that that you all who are on the select board are thinking the same thing, because I do believe that that's a that's a true statement. So, um, you know, a lot of tough things were talked about tonight. I appreciate your listening to us, um, and um, I, I personally will do whatever I can to help the planning commission process to see if we can get a good product out of this in as fast a time as possible. But thank you all very much. Thank you, uh, Mike. I too think that the May 1st date is probably fairly reasonable. You know, I don't, I, you hate to put too much pressure, but also we're in a position where we have to get things done. Uh, the other thing is that um, I guess I get concerned about is let's all just do the do do the right thing. Take the time to do what we need need to do. Uh, if if it takes a little bit more time, you know, sometimes temp, you know, people's you know, people misconstrue what people are saying. I know if Bill gives Steve marching orders and saying. You know, I think we we just we just want to get the right product done. I know I made some suggestions, and that's where I thought I could get some information from the planning commission because I felt the two thousand square foot limit was a little low, you know. But yet I didn't think maybe it's as high as five thousand. That's where I was looking for all the planning commission. I figured between Steve and all the members of the planning commission, you would have a better sense of that. So that's you know again. Some of us on the on the select board are not planners, so uh, we, you know, even though I have some background in planning, I do want your input, and I think that's really important to get a good product. That's all I have to say. Thanks. All right. Um, thank you. Sorry. I think this was a very good conversation tonight. So. Um, again, I appreciate everyone's time and I know it's the 10 o'clock hour. So um, I don't think any motion will be made this evening. So we will continue the conversation after tonight. Um, thanks again for everyone for attending. Um, we'll close the public portion of the meeting. And as far as I can tell, there will be no motion this evening. I have to find my agenda. Just a second. <laughs> Um, so I don't think there are any select board continuations, um, and then we're going to go into managers items. Right. Thank you all. Thanks, Jason. Thank you for very much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, so managers items, Hunger Mountain Children's Center. And I believe we need to go to an somebody, executive somebody session for this. Has somebody got the motion for that? Yeah. yeah so both of the uh, both of the managers' items, Hunger Mountain and uh, ESP contract, are both executive session issues. Um, so you know, Patty can leave once the motion is made, um, and. I'm not going to be able to share my screen or anything, and I'll tell you why later. But Steve, you don't have to stay either if you don't want to, as long as you keep things going. But the recording has to be shut off once they go into right. executive session. Okay, I'll shut that up, Bill. I think yeah, I can make you host, and then you can end the meeting. But once the rec um, I'll turn off the recording. Yeah, well, they need to make the motion to go into executive session first and vote on that, and then you can turn off the recording. Okay. I have it in front of me if you'd like me to read it. Okay. I move to find that premature general public knowledge of the town's litigation strategy in the HMCC tax appeal currently pending in the Vermont Superior Court Civil Division 
We've clearly placed the select board, which has control over such litigation for the town at a substantial disadvantage. And I move to find that premature general public knowledge of the town's litigation strategy with the state of Vermont in a contractual discussion for police services would clearly place the select board, which has control over such negations, negotiations for the town at a substantial disadvantage. Thank you. Is there a second? Yeah. All right. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay, so Steve, you need to shut the recording off. And then I'm not sure if Orca is really there. If you can get Orca out. Okay. And, and then Lisa and Patty and Steve will have to leave. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Steve. Okay, sure. Uh, I'm gonna, Thank you, I'm Steve. I want to get um, Bill set up to um, be the host. Just Hold on, I'm just gonna remove Orca.